Select Board's meeting of Wednesday, September 8th, 2021. Would everyone please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? We'll put our flag up on the screen. Okay, in case we don't have that graphic, uh, why don't we start? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you to Susie for getting us that graphic of the flag. Um, it, this meeting is being conducted remotely this evening pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, signed by Governor Baker on June 16th, 2021. Could we go around the Zoom room and introduce ourselves? My name is Katie Conlon. I'm the chair of the board. Papa Doyle, vice chair. Mike Sula, secretary. Melinda Collins. Richard Wells, member. Melinda, you're on mute, so we didn't quite hear what you said, but... Uh, Melinda Collins, member. Thank you. And we're also joined this evening by Michael Dennehy, the town administrator, and Susie Stewart, our executive administrative assistant in the select board office. Um, with the board's permission, I want to defer two items tonight, and we have one item we're going to take out of order. The two items to be proposed to be deferred are number eight, which is a discussion and vote on new equity and justice committee members. And number 17, the policy committee's second reading of operational policies and procedures. Uh, so if that's agreeable to everyone, we'll defer those to a future meeting. And uh, I see no objection or hearing no objection. Number five on our agenda is a request from our town moderator, Bob Hiss, to conduct the October 25th, 2021 special town meeting remotely. Uh, and Mr. Hiss has a, another commitment this evening, so he's asked to join us at this time. And I see he's been moved up to panelist. Welcome, Bob. We're happy to, to meet with you on this request this evening. Thanks Thank for Thank you very us. much. I appreciate it, Madam Chair. Uh, so just a few things. Uh, as you know, um, the town has implemented uh, the mask mandate for uh, town facilities. Uh, the governor has extended the remote meeting capability that he made available during the height of the COVID crisis um, to occur uh, out into the window that our October 25 town meeting will occur. Uh, so we're presented with the opportunity to either have the meeting uh, back in the high school, should we wish to, or uh, conduct remote. So I've done a little research uh, between Mike Dennehy and I. We surveyed approximately uh, 20 towns that were all doing special fall meetings, uh, September, October, November. Interestingly, of the 20 towns, 65% uh, are planning on having them uh, indoors. I was kind of surprised by that number, typically with uh, masks and social distancing by family. That may change because not every town has gone through the current mass mandate that Milton has, but a surprising amount. But I also wanted to get a sense from our membership. So I sent out uh, a survey this morning. I received uh, a 63% response um, out of all the uh, town meeting members. Of those, 44% uh, said they would not attend an in-person meeting under any conditions, with masks, without, with distancing, without anything. And so that's such a large percentage uh, for Milton that even if we got lucky and came out this COVID Delta variant in four weeks, like Provincetown has and other um, parts of the world have, I get the sense it would be, we'd risk our quorum if we decided to hold it in person. So based on all that research, my recommendation uh, uh, administered in the board support is to vote to approve this as another remote town meeting conducted over Zoom uh, webinar as we have conducted the past six, I believe, <laughs> town meetings. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hiss. Does any member of the board have any comment or question for Mr. Hiss? Mr. Wells. Madam Chair, is, is, is the moderator asking for us to take a vote? Is that what he's asking for? I think he's asking, yes, I think for support for the, for his recommendation. Is that correct, um, Bob? That's, that's right. Well, yeah, purpose, technically the moderator can decide, but I, I'd like right to thought. get the board, yeah, the, I'd like to get the board support. We've done it in the past, and I think it would help um, uh, build uh, consensus around the recommendation. Given that, Madam Chair, for the purpose of discussion, I'll make a motion to support the moderator's request for the October special town meeting. We'll hold it remotely. 
Second. Okay, the motion's made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, seeing and hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zillis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. And myself, yes. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bob. We'll, uh, we'll pass that along to town council, the warrant committee and others, and, um, and make the appropriate arrangements for the warrant preparation. We'll close thank the you right for the notice. time, and thank you for indulging my schedule. So uh, let's carry on. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Night. Okay, before we get to public comment, um, I just wanted to mention, and we're going to cover this a little bit more in detail at the end of the meeting, just want to invite all residents of the town to either take part in person at the vigil that the town of Milton and the Milton Interfaith Clergy Association will be holding on Friday evening, September 10th, uh, to observe the 20th anniversary of September 11th, 2001, and the terrorist attack on the United States. As, as many residents who are watching may know, at our prior meetings, we've decided to hold a vigil that evening. And it's going to be broadcast live on Milton Access Television. We are out, we have a featured speaker coming from New York that Mr. Wells has made arrangements uh, to join as a, a New York Deputy Superintendent who's going to speak about 9-11. And uh, we have a program that we're going to be publishing, I think, tomorrow, uh, just to um, put out word of what the, what the events will be. We're also going to have, a, we have a request from two students at the Milton High School who are Project 351 ambassadors, and they are proposing to put together a nice stone tribute garden uh, that they're going to place at the gazebo. They're working with the town administrator to make that arrangement tomorrow for Friday, and that will be a nice tribute for residents to come and look at. I, I'm not sure if that will be up for several days, or if, you know, if someone is not able to attend the vigil, they may be able to see it over the weekend uh, or early next week. So uh, we also have a blood drive tomorrow that's part of our 9-11 observance. Susie Stewart of the Select Board's office has worked on these blood drives before, has made a lot of the arrangements, and we have had a terrific response to that. So uh, if anyone would still like to participate, there's information on the town website about the blood drive and also about the vigil, and there will be more information going out tomorrow. We encourage residents of the town to participate. Yes, Mr. Doyle has his hand raised. Madam Chair, I would like to uh, thank you uh, as chair. I'd like to thank uh, of the Milton Interfaith Clergy Association, um, Member Wells, Mr. Dennehy, and Susie Stewart for all of the work that went into the preparation of the Milton Vigil. It was a great team effort. And yourself, Arthur, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is public comment. If we have any residents here for public comment, please use the uh, raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to address the board. I see no one on a telephone line this evening, so uh, the telephone instructions in any event are star nine, but seeing no one on the phone, it's just the raised hand function. And I, I see no hands raised among the attendees. We'll wait another few seconds and see if anyone may raise a hand. Okay, seeing none, we can go on to number four, which is a COVID-19 update. And we're gonna be joined by Caroline Kinsella, our public health director. I see Ms. Kinsella has already joined us. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, select board members. I'm gonna give you a report on what we're seeing in the health department. So this past week, I've observed COVID-19 cases decreasing compared to one or two weeks ago. This past Saturday, two cases, Sunday, one, Monday, four cases, and yesterday we had zero cases. Today, this morning, we had three cases and I was very hopeful but in the afternoon after four o'clock, we've got seven more. So we'll keep an eye on the cases, but for the most part this week, they have been um, trending down. Monday's uh, Milton's 14 day percent positivity is 2.24%, uh, which is slightly higher than last week, which was 2.17%. In the past two weeks, the case count has been 61 over 14 days. About half of those cases have been vaccinated for COVID-19, and we're seeing those are called the breakthrough cases, which according to our phone interviews, when we speak to residents, we're hearing that their symptoms are primarily mild, headaches, loss of smell or taste, cold or allergy symptoms. Unvaccinated COVID-19 cases seem to be having more severe symptoms, 
And today I spoke to Missy, who's the infection control nurse at BID Milton Hospital. And currently there are six unvaccinated patients who are inpatient. Three of those six patients are in the intensive care unit. So it goes to show, and this I spoke with her last week also, and last week there was five um, inpatient, and they were all unvac unvaccinated, that we really have to keep on pushing people to get vaccinated to decrease disease and deaths in Milton. Um, I also checked uh, the mass.gov website and 67% of the population over 12 years old is fully vaccinated. So that number has inched up over the past couple of weeks too, is 65, then 66, now 67% fully vaccinated. So as I said, we're, we are seeing some breakthrough cases and it's mainly half and half, but for the most part, when we are reaching out to residents, they are, uh, they're reporting to us that their symptoms are mild. So that is good news. And, you know, we are flattening the curve and, um, the people in um, the hospital, unfortunately, they are the unvaccinated is what we're seeing. And that's my report. And, and Caroline, do you want to speak just to the order that the Board of Health issued? They, they've issued two orders recently. I think we've already covered the first one at one of our prior meetings. Could you speak to this, the last, the most recent order? Yes, yeah, so the last, the most recent order started um, right after Labor Day on Tuesday. That is um, vaccinated or unvaccinated residents that are coming into town hall. Um, need to wear a mask, and that in also includes the employees um, in all municipal buildings. So it's the second order that's also including all municipal employees to be vaccinated. I mean, I'm sorry, vaccinated to be masked, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. So that includes the council on aging, um, the town hall, the library, and they put that in place this week. Okay, thank you. I, I know that everyone has received a copy of the order. Uh, it also mentions that the Board of Health strongly recommends that individuals wear face coverings while inside private businesses in the town. That's um, so it's not a mandate, but it's a strong recommendation that that be the case. Yes. Is, is there any color you can add to that, Caroline, in terms of the Board of Health's thoughts? I know some communities have put in a mandate, not all of them have. Um, so the, the Board of Health is watching closely the numbers and still we're at a 2% level, which is really in the yellow zone. Um, as I said before, you know, if the cases start to rise rapidly, the Board of Health can come together and put more mandates in. But at this time, they felt um, that um, the second order um, was warranted, but they went um, not so far as to um, require the, the uh, businesses to have uh, masks inside. But as I said, the Board of Health is watching that closely. And um, we will be making some decisions if, if, the, if the numbers change. Okay, thank you. That's, that's good information for residents to have. Uh, I see Mr. Doyle has his hand raised. Madam Chair, I just note that I saw a very significant increase today over yesterday in the use of masks uh, external to businesses and within businesses, um, several of which I visited in East Milton Square over the past couple of days. I just had one question for Caroline whether there was any uh, noticeable shift in the age population? No, not really. Um, we're seeing it between 20 and 40 years old, right, right in the middle. Um, just today, I'm seeing um, two or three more um, younger residents, like 16, nine, and seven. So um, we haven't been seeing too many children, but um, just two or three today. Thank you. And we're in close contact with the schools. I'm in close contact with Kim Coughlin. I've been on the phone with her twice today, um, going over the numbers and some cases that she's seeing on her end. So we're working together with the schools. Okay, thank you. I see Mr. Wells has his hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Caroline. Quick question, Caroline. On our frontline, uh, first responder on our frontline, this health workers, I know we're getting close to that eight month window. Any thought on the booster? Is that something we as a, your department's gonna handle or are they just going to go off on their own to get the booster? I know I just conversed with one close to me today and she's just about at the eight months already. So we, we're hearing about that and we really haven't got a lot of direction from the state. Even though we get state calls at least once a week, um, we have not heard more information about the booster we're just starting to get the seasonal flu vaccine into our office right now. 
We got um, one shipment this week, and we'll be starting the seasonal flu vaccine uh, dates in the in October. But I have not heard anything about the boosters or where that where those shipments are going to go. If they're going to go to the pharmacies, or if they're going to um, allow the health departments to um, run some clinics again, like we did in the spring. Okay. We'll see. Thanks. I just knew we're getting close. I, I believe wasn't on, around last January. Started giving you first shots. Yes, it was. Right. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you again for everything, Caroline. Okay. Does anyone anyone else on the board have a comment or a question for Caroline? Uh, seeing none, then Caroline, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate thank you, your time and thank you for the update. Thank you. Take Thanks, care, Caroline. everyone. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Okay. Our next agenda item is a presentation and a discussion on a mixed use commercial and residential development at 426 and 440 Granite Avenue. I see that uh, we've moved attorney Marion McKetrick up to panelists. Uh, there's a few other people who are going to be joining us who I think are in the attendee group, which uh, Marion, would you like us to move up some of the others on your team? Uh, yes, I think um, we'd like Tony Shaw and Ellen Anceloni and Michael Moore and Pat Costello if they're if they're both on the meeting. Um, we are going to be asking to share screens because we want to show a pre brief presentation. Thank you. I see Susie's already starting to move people up. So, um, Ellen please Anceloni. Forgive, please forgive me. Could you please repeat your team members again? Sure. Uh, Michael Moore and Pat Costello, Ellen Anceloni, and Tony Shaw. I don't see um, Mr. Costello, although I, I did let attorney McGetrick know we may not have gotten to this this evening until 7.30, so it's possible he may still be joining us. Um, would you like to get started at this time, Marion? Do we need to wait for Mr. Costello? Uh, no, we don't need to. He wasn't positive he would be able to attend, but he was going to try. Okay. Uh, as long as Ellen, um, is Tony Shaw on or is Ellen able to share screen? Um, I, I have made might... you... I have, I, if you can let me share my screen, that'd be great. And Marion, I do see Mr. Shaw and Mr. Moore. Oh, okay. All right. They well, are now panelists. Whoever wants to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to briefly um, introduce our meeting with you tonight. First of all, say thank you very much for allowing us to come and speak to the Board of Selectmen. Um, I've been working with uh, this team of Michael Moore, Pat Costello, and uh, the architectural firm of Feingold Alexander and all of their um, architects since last October, approximately, looking at this site at 440, 426, 440 Granite Ave and 29 Mechanic Street. It's a triangular shaped lot. We're gonna show you this presentation and explain what the site is. Um, we're really interested in getting your feedback as select board members. We'd like to know what your perspective is. We certainly hope to have your support as well, but we appreciate the opportunity to come before you and just show you what it is what the concept plan is for this. Um, my contribution so far with this project has been to, of course, prepare the applications, but I have reviewed the existing zoning, um, the East Milton Square zoning concepts currently under discussion and the history of this site. So we've looked at it um, in, in a fair amount of depth. We've met with a historical commission um, and we've had some community meetings, all of which we'll be describing to you. It's been quite clear from the beginning that any new building on this triangular lot, which is at one end of the business district, requires a unique design to mitigate the directly adjacent expressway. The noise is tremendous from the expressway at this site and all along this edge of the business district. Um, and at the same time, any proposal has to provide some distance from Mechanic Street residences on the other side. And finally, any new building in this location needs to be attractive and needs to be a, a, a good looking gateway to the town. So in addition to having to address these constraints, the developers have intended from the beginning to create a multi-unit home ownership mixed use project. So with some commercial and with some affordable units. 
Um, over these last nine months, the concept plan has been revised and developed in more detail. So that's what we're gonna show you tonight is where we are right now, what, what this um, proposal would look like if it's approved. Um, and we're gonna share screens with you to show you this presentation. And Ellen Anceloni and Tony Chow will explain it to you. So we can go ahead with the presentation. And Marion, just before you do that, just so that all the members of our board are, are aware and we're all on the same page, this is currently pending before the planning board for a site plan approval, I think, is that correct? And also before the board of appeals for a variance. But yes, you can correct you. me if I'm wrong on that. We are currently before the planning board with site plan approval. Our next meeting is September 22nd. We do not yet have a scheduled hearing for, with the Board of Appeals, but there are variances required for this project because we don't currently have zoning that allows this type of building. Um, and once we complete the site plan approval process and have plenty of feedback from that, we expect to be able to go into the Board of Appeals. However, as you know, the Board of Appeals is extremely busy right now. So we don't know exactly when that hearing will be rescheduled, but that will be coming up as well. So there's gonna be a long process of review. Okay, thank you. Um, just checking, everybody can see my screen with this presentation. Thank you. Thanks yes. again for inviting us. Uh, I'm Ellen Anceloni. I, I am a principal at Feingold Alexander Architects, and I'm also a resident uh, of Milton for over 20 years. Uh, we're really excited for this project, and I know you guys are busy, so we're not going to take. Recording in Hello, progress. Uh, great to be here again tonight. Thank you all for your time. I'm also a principal and director of design at Fango and Alexander Architects. So I think without further ado, why don't we just launch into showing you where we are. So of course, this is a site at 440 Granite at the intersection of Granite Avenue and Mechanic Street. And it consists of this somewhat triangular parcel where the proposed development is going to be placed. And one of the things that we wanted to stress about the project in, in its, in its um, opportunities, there are some significant, we believe, benefits. Um, it is a home ownership project, and it will largely be targeted towards the empty nesters and young couples. 10% of the units will be affordable. It's also important because it's going to help to meet the needs of the town's housing uh, product plan, and it also will provide an additional Class A commercial space, doubling the existing amount of commercial space on the site. And it will be a significant increase in the back tax base of almost uh, 300,000 a year, or almost a tenfold increase um, in terms of its annual revenue. It will create a gateway building for the town, and the commercial space will also house additional town amenity spaces. The other important part is that we're really trying to achieve a high level of sustainability for this project. So it will be an all electric source building, I think, which is a significant a step, particularly for a multi use mixed use development, and it will consist of also photovoltaics on the roof. It'll also incorporate a, a very efficient automated parking system, which further minimizes the footprint and also reduces carbon impact. There will be charging stations for, for the electric vehicles, which can range from as few as 20% to 100%, depending on the use pattern of the owners. It's also gonna have a high thermal performing envelope for the facade and a high efficient mechanical system and there will be a green roof on the second level to reduce the heat island effect and also absorb additional stormwater runoff. There will be significant bike storage facilities both on the ground level and in the basement. And it will use sustainable material throughout with high degree of recycled content and harvest the rainwater and use it for plant watering. So we, we believe we're trying to achieve a high level of sustainability on this project, which we think is very important, especially in today's world. I'm not gonna rattle off this except to just point out that we've had significant number of meetings uh, throughout this project dating back to October of last year. Uh, and there have been a number of hearings with the Milton Planning Board. We've toured um, the parking facilities, planning board members. It was involved with uh, Milton Historical Commissions, um, East Neighborhood M Milton Association and adjacent property owners, as well as the Housing Committee and Master Plan Implementation Committee. So. These are just a few select key meetings that have been held over the course of these past uh, 16 or so or 18 months. So with respect to the site plan, this is uh, really what we call the site plan or landscape plan as shown at level one. And we're just gonna point out a few key things on this site. So Granite Avenue is oriented at the bottom of the page and Mechanic Street is on the diagonal at the upper right. 
And the way this building operates is that we're going to do several uh, key site improvement uh, opportunities here. And start, starting on Granite Avenue, um, one of the key things that we're going to do is we're actually adding three additional parking spaces and eliminating the current curb cuts, which currently exist into the multiple retail tenants. So that will help to reduce the amount of uh, cross traffic uh, issues that currently exist. Um, in addition to that, there will also be enhanced parking spaces for proposed lighting and drop off at the far right. This will be for deliveries and also for larger vehicles as well, uh, dedicated for that intended use. Um, as we turn to the right along Mechanic Street, we have also shown here essentially one en entry, which is for the parking garage at where the Ellen is pointing out in the arrow. So we, we basically pull into the automated parking system and we can explain that further off Mechanic Street and it, it remains a one-way street. And then further up the page, there are four additional parking spaces shown on the surface um, dedicated uh, for additional parking and primarily for the business owners. Some other key things about the site too that we're incorporating here are uh, some steps, substantial um, landscape and site improvements. Uh, we want to line the edge with uh, granite curbing. We also want to put a brick a, a paving at the perimeter. We've seen this evident in the East Milton Business District. We want to carry that thread through and build off that uh, development that's already occurred in other parts of the district. We also incorporate a number of street plantings, which both a combination of trees along the street. We're placing a planter element at the corner where Mechanic Street and Granite Avenue intersect and also providing some additional small planting elements at the notches in the plan. And then finally, on the far left side, um, we have an additional landscape buffer uh, showing here there's some additional planting, both in respect to some of the neighbors, but also to create a green strip along that far left edge. So these are some of the significant things. And then finally, the other things that we will point out is that there will be bike racks provided. Uh, we're looking to, you know, uh, produce um, sufficient lighting. And, and I think what has been explored or being explored is potentially trying to eliminate the overhead telephone uh, wire systems that exist along the street. So that is currently under review, but um, if we're able to do that, I think that will be a very positive uh, impact for the for this particular block of the district if we can eliminate those overhead telephone poles. The last thing I'll point out, sorry, the other thing, oh, we can leave it on this plan, that's okay, Ellen, we can flip. So the other thing I'm pointing out to the side before we go into the details, there's also a transformer location in the back here adjacent to the parking, uh, which is basically screened off by some planting. So let's talk a little bit more about what happens on the ground floor. So again, going back to Granite Avenue at the bottom of the page, the areas that are colored in pink salmon, these are the retail uh, proposed uh, opportunities. They total just a little over 4,000 square feet, you know, shown as subdivided to practically three retail uh, tenants, but that could change depending on the use and the tenant. Uh, but that really is intended to be occupied to activate the street and to provide additional opportunities for commercial development but these are not intended to be uh, high density developments like restaurants or things like that. Uh, they're intended really to be thought of as more commercial office, uh, those kind of de proposed developments. Um, so I think this is one of the things that's important that we want to point out. There's also the at lobby entrance to the residence, which occurs right there where Ellen is showing, and this will bring directly into the residential lobby coming out the street. Um, and as we turn the corner and move towards the back, coming in along the parking. So what we pointed out is that the entrance to the parking uh, system occurs along Mechanic Street. And this system accommodates 38 parking spaces in an automated system, which is much more compact and much more efficient, but accommodates uh, full-size SUVs uh, throughout. Um, and I know that some members have already from the planning board toured several facilities that are actually in operation in the city. And again, we welcome uh, folks who are not familiar with this to visit with some of them and that can be arranged but this allows us to accommodate a total of 42 insurer parking spaces 30 which are uh, 38 which are automated and four additional surface parking spaces including two for handicap use and a van uh, so this is a very efficient parking system for the project um, in, as a whole uh, there are some other additional areas there's some some trash recycling but that is strictly going to be uh, only for small areas and um, and just only on the intermittent time they're needed. And again, the four standard parking spaces at the back shown in the far upper left corner intended primarily for uh, additional parking for the project. As you move up to the typical floor plan, this is actually a level two plan, but it's fairly typical. So 
Uh, on the plans, we basically have a mixture of primarily ones and predominantly two bedroom units, um, totaling I think 33 units in, in, in total in the development. And uh, the intention is again for the projects really to be geared towards empty nesters uh, or young professionals. Uh, they're not intended for families because they're simply not big enough and the amount of bedroom sizes are primarily ones and twos. We do also show on this level uh, that what I described before, there's a green roof element uh, in the upper corner that extends over that uh, surface parking below and part of the garage. And then there's some private terraces at the back as shown in this plan. So just some views looking at the project as a whole. So this is a view taken along the expressway uh, and with Granite Avenue, uh, of course, lining the edge. And this starts to give you a sense of the proposed development. I think one of the key things we tried to incorporate in the design is to look at a way to break up the scale of the massing. Um, it does mass up to five stories with one floor of ground floor retail, but the fifth floor begins to notch back and set back at the upper level. And we additionally introduce these uh, break elements, which are in the kind of dark gray uh, coloration, which helps to further break down the scale of the massing as it particularly lies along the street. This is another view taken at eye level along Granite Avenue at the intersection uh, on, on the left and Mechanic Street on the right. And again, what we really want to point out here is again, the importance of trying to activate the ground plane and streetscape so that you, you can see here the development of the retail opportunities lining along the street and along the, along the sidewalk and creating an active zone in order to enhance activity. Uh, and then the residential uh, components occur above from levels two through five. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit on the materials along Granite Avenue. We're suggesting that this is essentially a brick, a brick cladding system, which are shown in sort of the areas that are outlined in, as Ellen is going through it. Uh, we have some uh, sort of panelized systems in the rest of the project, and we have some examples that we'll get into detail later. But the intent for the project as a whole is to introduce scale, variety, and interest, and the introduction of some color elements as well. Uh, adds a certain liveliness as well as a more uh, smaller scale device. So we we believe we're trying to affect um, amount of residential scale and details as we can on the project as a whole using high quality materials throughout. As you look along the back along Mechanic Street, um, what we see here again is one of the key things that we also want to describe on the project is that the massing of the project, the bulk of it is really pushed towards Granite Avenue in order to push it away from the residential areas of the back. So uh, what you see here is the bulk of the massing is really lining along Granite Ave. And then you can clearly see it starts to step down as we move towards the lower sections on the second floor. And then the covered green roof area on the first floor curving those parking areas below. And then the fifth floor itself, that further sets back on the top level too to create additional scale break and to further mitigate the scale as well. So I think we're trying to really trying to break down the scale both in terms of the details, the fenestration, but also the massing as we look at this project. There was also some discussion among uh, several folks, uh, as well as on the planning board, of whether there was consideration and opportunity for a different thought. So instead of parking, we looked at an idea of potentially a pocket park. So this idea could enhance more of a greenscape, you know, a small landscape park element that occurs as shown in that sketch. Uh, of course, that in doing that, it will uh, result in the loss of those four parking spaces, but and we're certainly open and amenable to discussion and thoughts as to what the community and, and members such as yourself think about this idea. But this is an alternative notion about the idea of a pocket park uh, in place of parking. And then as we get towards the latter part of the, our presentation, uh, these last few slides, this shows the corner uh, taken at the intersection of Granite Avenue, and again on the left, Mechanic on the right. And the intent really is this, you can see, is to activate the scale with an open sort of retail component a residential lobby. And then this also gives you some clue as to the idea that we want to really enhance the streetscape with the enhanced sidewalk edges, with the brick paving, the granite curb, the tree planting, uh, the introduction of bike racks, the introduction as much uh, greenscape as we're able to within this, within the, you know, the site. And then also the use of high quality materials with the use of, you know, quite a bit of glass, brick, panelized system. So that especially as one walks along the building edge, that one senses there's really good materials that are very durable and, and very um, sort of high, high in recycle content that also speaks to trying to address activation along the street. This is just a, a looser sketch. This shows a little bit more towards the residential lobby, but again, points out a few things. The, the notch idea in the, in the massing helps to break the scale. Also at the street and open up the sidewalk further 
and creates an opportunity for potentially entrances to retail tenants. And then the residential lobby will have its own sort of uh, identifying element with a small canopy and uh, signage in terms of bringing into the residences. So again, allows further activation of this component as well as the retail tenants. The details about the materials, um, as I described, uh, the large part consists of a few key things. The main facade uh, that traditionally faces towards uh, Granite Avenue as well as parts of the base is brick. And we're also not just brick, but we're looking at a more extended linear brick that is a little bit longer, a little bit more elegant and refined as we're proposing for this project. We're also looking at a series of elements such as precast frames, the range around the windows. There's further details on the brick that you can see that it has some shadow line elements to break down the scale in addition. We also have additional uh, elements uh, such as brake metal colors to introduce further detail and, and interest. And then fiber cement cladding in other parts of the building, uh, both in terms of the idea that you can see it on the cladding on the right, as well as the niche elements in the darker gray on the left. And the use of introduction of color is uh, very achievable because essentially in fiber cement, we can paint any color we want. So we can basically pull through it. And as we look at this more carefully, we of course will have samples and review all of that in detail as the project moves forward. And then this last piece of shows again, focusing in on the ground level. So even here on the areas that, that deal with the more, say, um, uh, support areas such as trash areas and other things in the entrance of the garage, we're still proposing high quality materials and using brick. And the example on the right just gives you some sense of the precedent that we're creating some shadow line, some details, some relief and visual interest. So it's not just simple brick, but we're adding also detail even in the areas that are not quite as prominent or as visible because we feel, especially on the ground plane, that it's very important that as pedestrians and people move along the building, that you sense a high quality use of materials in the project throughout. And so finally, this concludes uh, the presentation and brings us back to the, to the corner view. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shaw. Marion, do you have others on the team who would like to address the project? Uh I'm not sure whether Michael Moore, um, if he's here, wants to say anything. Um, you, Some of us in Milton know Michael Moore as the developer of 36 Central Ave. Um, so he certainly has experience with many other projects and other locations, but he is a local developer as well. Um, so we're, I've been very, I've enjoyed working with him so far in this project. So Michael, do, are you here and do you wanna say anything? Sure, thanks Marion. And uh, thank you to the Select Board for inviting us here. Um, I'm a Milton resident, I've been living here since uh, almost 10 years. Uh, we have um, our office here at Central Ave, we built Central Ave around that same time and you know, it's personal but it's exciting and we're, we have a great team and we really uh, think this is a great project for Milton. It's in not just in the increased tax revenue, but the type of housing that we can provide to the empty nesters, there really is nothing. If you want to downsize and you've lived your life in Milton, you don't have very many options. You can try and get into 88 Wharf or some other smaller developments, but it, there's nothing out there. So we think this is a great project for the town and uh, we're excited to get it started. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Attorney McGettrick, do you have anything else that you'd like to add or anyone on the team would like to add? And then we can open it up to discussion and questions from our members. I don't have anything to add. Um, we'd certainly be interested in any questions or comments um, members of the select board may have. So thank you. I don't know okay, if anyone else on the board on the team wants to speak, but I think we're all set. Okay, and, th and thank you all for coming and joining our meeting this evening. I, I should mention this, proposal has been presented to the Master Plan Implementation Committee, the Select Board's Housing Committee, some members of the Affordable Housing Trust um, who were at a joint meeting. So um, to some extent, some members of the board have already um, heard the presentation and may have already asked questions and some I know have weighed in um, at those meetings. But I'd like to open it up to our board at this time. If anyone has questions or comments on this proposal, um, it's a little bit hard to see any hands raised when we have the screen up, but I, we may we may still need this, this shared screen in case anyone wants to reference a particular slide. So is there anyone on our board who would like to ask any questions or offer any comments? 
I see Ms. Collins' hand. Ms. Collins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I thank you for noting that um, Mr. Moore and his team came before the Housing Committee and, as you said, to members of the Affordable Housing Trust and Master Plan Implementation Committee. Um, I'll, I'll let uh, Mr. Doyle uh, speak to the Master Plan Implementation folks, but the Housing Committee members who were there voted to support um, the concept of this plan uh, as far as design and all the the um, features that were just documented in the the presentation, so I'll just note that and um, and I still like it very much. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Madam Chair, to follow up on Collins' comment, uh, yes, the. Um, Members of the Master Plan Implementation Committee who were in attendance also supported uh, the concept and uh, their vote was 4-0 uh, in support. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Mr. Wells. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, you took my hand down? I didn't know how to do it. No, I didn't. All right, I got it done. I don't want to leave it up. I don't I don't use this function. I think if you just I click did. again on the raise hand. I did, I got it. It's okay. down. Thank you. So um, I had heard that um, both the Master Plan Implementation Committee and the Housing Committee had um, taken a vote to support this. Like Mr. Doyle, we both live here in East Milton, so I follow this very closely. Um, this building reminds me a lot of uh, a, a very unique but very similar building that's in Ashmont on Dorchester Avenue across from Tobolo. Uh, it's the same type. It's commercial on the first floor. It has American provisions, a bike shop, a couple other things in the rest of it. It's residential. But it's very unique in, the, in its design as this is. Um, my thought is... To you, Madam Chair, and I know we all, this is not doesn't come under our jurisdiction, but you think um, at least for me, the experts that we use enough talk to think this is a good project and like this. Do you think it might be prudent for us to take a similar vote and forward, forward our results to the planning board um, on this project? And we don't have to do it tonight, but I, I know that we don't, I, I know it doesn't come under our purview, but um, I've gone to, as I say, I've personally, I've gone to a lot of meetings, I've listened, the experts I've talked to say this is a good project. Ellen is correct in that there are empty nesters in East Milton that want to stay in East Milton, and this is a place that can allow them to do that. And um, I just want to I open this really to our to my to our colleagues and you, Madam Chair. Is this something that we should consider doing? Well, I guess, I mean, Mr. Wells. MPIC, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, there has to be a reason why the MPIC and 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 the Housing Committee did. They're obviously seeing the same thing we are. Um, I'm not. I'm not afraid to do this, but I'm just wondering what the other members feel. So I, I think, Mr. Wells, it's up to the sense of the board whether we want to weigh in, and if we do, whether it's at this point or at a later date. Um, uh, so, I, so I think it's entirely up to what the majority here is and what, what the thoughts are among the members. You know, there are some abutters and residents who have raised concerns with the planning board. We've, I've watched enough of their meetings to know that there are issues that have been raised. I think they're around the area, mainly of the fifth floor and potential shadows, but um, so, you know, this is this is a, a meeting with the developer. It's not a meeting where we've you know asked the public to come in and give their input. Uh, that said, obviously we can we can do what we may wish to as a board. And I have some thoughts on the proposals. Oh, but I see Mr. Zulis's hand. Let me go to Mr. Zulis, uh, who may have a question or a comment for the development team. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two questions. But as uh, on the issue of whether we should vote, my preference would be to defer. Any vote on this? It's not on the agenda for a vote, and frankly, I'd like to, I'd like to um, uh, look at it a little bit more, uh, a little further.
further before voting on it, but, um, but that's my sense. On the question- I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I was a suggest we had to do it tonight. I wish- Yeah, no, that you know, makes sense. This, okay, yeah, thank you, sense. sorry. I'm, I'm, always, I'm always in favor of taking a position. I just want a little more time on this one. Um, uh, two questions, I think for Mr. Shao. Uh, one, um, you mentioned the 10% affordable and 33 units. Does that mean four affordable units or three affordable units? <laughs> I'm hoping four, but, uh, but what do we- what, what's the 10 percent what's 10 percent of 33 we were, we were planning to make a cash contribution to the balance if okay. that was acceptable so 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 a cash so so no affordable units but a cash contribution or or some affordable units and cash three contribution. three affordable units and then a cash contribution okay three affordable and the cash okay okay um okay and and did you have any discussions in, in, in uh, I didn't intend this question, but did you have any discussions? Did you think there would, it would be fruitful to have discussions with the Affordable Housing Trust about perhaps having more affordable units um, in lieu of the cash and maybe the affordable housing, you could work with the Affordable Housing Trust on that uh, in terms of getting some financial assistance and having more affordable units in the project going forward. Um, well, we had anticipated we were going to have to meet with them and then sit down and discuss once we got past um, some of the hurdles we have right now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I'd encourage you to meet with the Affordable Housing Trust, and certainly they they have they, they may have some fruitful ideas on um, additional units and maybe maybe uh, working with the trust in terms of funding. Um, the second question I have is the, um, and thank you, Mr. Moore, for that. And, and the second question I think is Mr. Shaw, but whoever whoever wants to answer it, and, and that is uh, the height uh, of the of the um, of the proposed building. Um, I don't I don't have in my mind's eye the height of the current buildings on the site. And so, could you just tell me what the height of the current buildings is, and what's the difference between the current height and the proposed height? I can tell you that. So the existing, um, the buildings on the existing site it vary, right? Because there's there's right. single family. Uh, so the average is probably around two and a half stories. Some are two stories. Uh, so 35 feet, probably. That's my best guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we have here is we to the top of our building. Let me just point it out right here. This mm -hmm. is below 70 feet. It's 68 and change. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Um, what you don't see that, and you're not going to see it in any of these images because you just can't see it, is above this, we have a mechanical area on the roof, which we are putting a screening system around it just so people don't see the actual mechanical equipment. Uh, it helps for a, a visual and it also helps for noise. Um, but I can tell you that expressway will drown down any noise that's created from our building. Uh, so that 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 is that's the height, and we can get into more detail if you, you can uh, send along some more information through Marion if that would help. And and just one one you mentioned that mechanical uh, equipment does the mechanical equipment take it above the sixty eight feet or is that kind of yes it does okay in the and that's the. It seems to be the focus of, of many folks. I'm just going to flip back if I can to show you a roof plan. Oh, we don't have one here. Sorry. Um, but see, uh, and we, you know, we're just, we're being very honest. So this is across the street, across mm -hmm. the expressway. You can start to see the screen. Okay. And so it's not that large. And the other thing that we have on the roof is um, photovoltaic. will take up the remainder of the roof. And I just want to, since I do an off mute, I just wanted to say, you know, for in our business of architecture, um, all electric buildings is the wave of the future. We work with a number of developers in Michael and Pat uh, are one of the first group that actually would stood up and said, we're going to do this because it's less fossil fuel. Um, so we commend them for that. And it, I, I believe it is probably one of the first to be proposed in Milton. I could be wrong on that, but I think it might be. Yeah, I, I believe the building height is 64 feet, seven inches. Um, that's to the top of the top edge, not to the top of the mechanicals. 
um, the reason the building, the, the building therefore in the business district zoning would require a special permit for a 65 foot height or five, five stories. However, in our, uh, well, the way our zoning bylaw is interpreted by the building commissioner and also part of the provisions of the zoning, zoning bylaw say that um, the building commissioner interprets the enclosure as part of the height. So that adds height. So that requires a variance. And also the opening for the stairs going onto the roof, which you can't really see here, but it's similar to the enclosures, that is in the zoning and is counted as part of the height. So, you know, I'm not, um, this is clearly a higher building than what we have now in this area. There's no question about it. This design is higher because it's a, nar a narrower building next to the expressway. We can provide all of the protective sound measures and high efficiency energy measures that it would be required to invest in a building in this location and keep it further away from Mechanic Street in the back by providing this type of height in the front. So it is a different kind of building. There's no question about it. It's really designed just for this site. It's not designed necessarily as a type of building for the, elsewhere in the square, but for this particular site, we think that it's appropriate and we think that it, it will fit in um, once completed. And thank you, Marion, for correcting me on the height. I'm, one thing I did wanna point out, one of the factors that's driving us to be that height is the first floor because we have the stacker parking. So we're trying to reduce our footprint and that's that drives up this first floor to about 13 feet, which is not typical what you would get, but it is beneficial to the retail spaces. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. And thank you for the presentation and for your time and for all the work you've done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zulis. I, I think I'd like to weigh in on a, with a few words. And I, first, I think Mr. Wells, Mr. Zulis is correct. I just looked at the agenda. It is just presentation and discussion. So I think tonight is probably not the right night for us to um, take a vote, even if we, even if a majority of the board wanted to do that. Um, and as for the Affordable Housing Trust, uh, when the Master Plan Implementation Committee and the Housing Committee met, the Affordable Housing Trust was invited and was a, was a posted meeting for our board. I'm our board's member on the Affordable Housing Trust. We did not have a quorum. We only had two members present that evening. So a couple of us heard the presentation, but the Affordable Housing Trust as a group um, did not have an opportunity to re really hear the presentation and take a position. So I think that's probably something that our chair, Julie Kramer, may want to put on a future agenda item. Um, I'd like to say a few of the things that I said at the at that meeting, um, just speaking individually as a member, as one member of the Affordable Housing Trust, um, and now as a member of this board. You know, I, I'm someone who kind of likes the brick buildings and the old fashioned look of a lot of buildings, but I, I really come to like this design. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for the, the, I love the design of the commercial space on the ground level. I like the setback on Mechanic Street. I think what was just recently said either by Ellen or Marion that, Maybe another section of town, this building may not be appropriate, but the, the height, the five-story height and the the um, the density, and well, the, let's really talk about the height. The height is really facing the expressway, and there's, there's no question that that's just a very loud area. So I, I think that the argument about the soundproofing and the, the extra cost that goes into a project like this on account of that makes sense to me that... Um, maybe the height that's being proposed, maybe it's needed because of that. I'm I'm certainly no expert. I, I'm a lay, lay person on any issues relating to architecture and design, but there's a lot that I support about this concept and the design. And I know that the Board of Appeals and the Planning Board are going to hear from not neighbors and abutters and those who have standing to, um, and any resident of the town who may wish to weigh in in this project. But, and, and obviously we leave to them decisions on variances and what the site plan should or shouldn't be approved, but speaking only to the general concept of this. I, I like this proposal. There's clearly a need for more diverse housing stock in our town. I think the housing production plan demonstrated that the current 40Bs that are pending, um, that, that has been demonstrated through the different hearings that are being held. And while this building may not look like something else that's in town in, in Milton. I think this is an appropriate design and I'd like to see Milton exploring projects that have the stacked parking, which is probably something that we're gonna be seeing more and more of. Um, 
So I, there's a real need to rejuvenate our business districts. I know when I ran for office in three elections, that was something that I talked about in my campaigns and it takes a long time to get there. The Milton Village zoning took us three years to get to town meeting. That was supposed to lead the East Milton design efforts, but Judy Barrett's presentation to us a few weeks ago, which has also been presented to the planning board, I think really demonstrated the need for creative thinking and for a different design for mixed use properties with some greater height um, than what the town perhaps is used to. I, I look at the Henry's building that's under construction and as a lay person, I probably would say that the back wall along the trolley tracks is five stories. Now the planning board experts might tell me it's really four stories with a ground level parking, but to a lay person like me, it looks like five stories. I think the, the wall of the Henry's building along the trolley tracks in some ways is similar to this project right along the highway. Um, where the height, especially given the soundproofing issues, the streetscape improvements that are gonna be presented here, if this is approved, the commercial space and the landscaping improvements um, all help rejuvenate an area that I think there's no question needs some life and rejuvenation. So speaking on the broad concepts, um, I like where this is going. I, I know there's been a lot of work that the team has put into revising this as the planning board has had multiple meetings and offered a lot of comments, but, um, it fulfills our need to diversify our housing stock. I think it's probably in the best interest of the town to have a development like this, especially in a location that fronts onto the highway. And um, I'm gener speaking generally as to the concept itself without getting into issues of specifics that other boards are going to handle and that other abutters may have issues that need to be addressed through those processes. I, um, I like this and I support where the developer is going with this project. So th that's my two cents. I see Ms. Collins has her hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanted to second everything that you just said, but um, I, I also wanted to note that uh, there have been many people who are asking our board to find more ways to generate revenue for the town. And if we... Um, have more development in appropriate places um, like this, that will help. We, we will have more revenue and there'll be more places for people to live. And um, and as you said, we'll be rejuvenating our um, our downtown business district at the same time that we're, we're actually improving our finances. Thank you. Mr. Wells. I have no idea how I did that, but um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I'm, I concur exactly with Ms. Collins and yourself on the thoughts um, you know, by right. And, and Ellen, you, uh, Mary, can comment on this. I think by right, the developer could go 45 feet with a commercial structure. Am I correct on that? Yes. And a, and a commercial structure of 45 feet on that footprint would truly impact in a negative way the neighborhood, the square, the abutters, everything far more than this would, as well as not addressing any of the issues that my colleagues have spoken to tonight. And my one thought, on, and back to Mr. Zulis's point, I wasn't asked to really take a position tonight. But if we are, it seems that we do support the concept of this. And if we are going to do this, I just ask that we, if we were to schedule a vote and take one, that we should do it sooner. I don't want to wait till it gets to the last night of uh, either the planning board or the ZBA hearing, particularly the planning board hearing, and then say, oh yeah, the select board took, I'd rather do it proactively versus reactively as much possible. Thank you for that. And thank you to Mr. McGetrick and Ms. Anselmo. Thank you to the developers. Um, it does appear that you're trying to bring something that is, is, as Ms. Conlon says, that will enhance um, our community in many ways. So thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Does anyone else have any comments or questions or or maybe discussion? Mr. Zulis, I'm sorry, you had your hand raised. Just very quickly, um, uh, just in, in, in terms of laying out our opinions, I think I'm gen generally in favor of this. 
Although let me restate and reemphasize the importance of getting as many affordable units rather than cash as possible. And if you work with the Affordable Housing Trust, there may be opportunities for funding from the Affordable Housing Trust. We have money in the Affordable Housing Trust now. And so there may be an opportunity to increase those number of units. When you're talking about empty nesters, you may be talking about the opportunity for empty nesters who have affordable housing needs in this kind of project. So, so for me, to the extent that we can, we can get those number of units higher than three, whether it be four or five or whatever it is, any increase for me uh, would be, uh, pardon me, would be an improvement. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zulis. And I'll, I'll bring that to the attention of Julie Kramer, the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust, and ask her to, to schedule a, a, maybe a discussion with Attorney McEttrick and her client at some point um, soon when it makes sense um, on this. And, and you know, I, let me just echo one other thing for the developer, because I know that there are some neighbors who have raised issues with the fifth story. On one of the 40B projects, I know there was a discussion among the panel and the developer about whether perhaps the unit size might be adjusted to eliminate the need um, for some of the additional units. And that, that perhaps that's something that would work here, perhaps it's not, but uh, that might be something to think about. I, I know that you've you've given a lot of thought to this already, but um, that, that's just one suggestion. So um, as this proceeds along before the planning board, and you said the zoning, zoning Board of Appeals has not yet scheduled it for a hearing on the variance, maybe if Attorney McGetrick could keep us up to date on the timing of that, mm -hmm. so that, you know, we, could consider a time that it might make sense to weigh in. I suppose it's possible that the planning board process could yield some changes to the project or some additional developments that we'd want to be aware of before we um, take any official vote. If that makes sense, Ms. McKetrick. Yes, of course. <laughs> we I'll keep you informed. Um, as I just said, the next site plan hearing um, is on September 22nd. That's all I know right now in terms of scheduling, but I will continue to keep the board informed as to how the scheduling is going. Um, certainly uh, meeting with um, the Affordable Housing Trust and Julie Kramer, there are all kinds of possible ideas. Um, there are some creative ways to do this. So, you know, we're, we're open to doing any of that. We've worked a lot on the design. I can't say that it's impossible, but I do think that the height of the building is a product of the location and the need to, to stay back from Mechanic Street. So I don't have high hopes about reducing the height. Um, and we have done a lot of work on the design to try to make it less um, uniform and more interesting and attractive. We'll continue to do that, continue to discuss this with the planning board. So thank you very much. It was really great to meet with all of you and to hear your comments. It's very helpful to us. Appreciate the time. Yeah. Thank, thank, you, so thank you all for coming in tonight. Uh, any development of this size is important for the town. So we appreciate your taking the time to come to our board, even though we, we're not the immediate um, board that you'd come to. We don't have specific jurisdiction over a zoning matter here. It's still, uh, I think, helpful to residents to hear this at our meetings. Some may watch our meetings and may not watch the planning board meeting or vice versa. And this may get the message out to a broader audience um, to know what's under consideration for the site and help people to, to weigh in on the on the proposal. So um, thank you for sharing your time with in the project with us this evening. Thank, thank you, you for your, your time. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone. Night. Thank you. Thanks. All right, and thank you to the board. Um, we are now on to item seven, which is a discussion and vote uh, on an equity and justice committee proposal for a, uh, I believe it's diversity, equity and inclusion policy. And um, we're joined by the chair of the Equity and Justice Committee, Pat Lattimore, and Chris Hart, a member of the Equity and Justice Committee. Uh, is there anyone else joining us this evening? From the, anyone in the attendee group that we need to move up? I don't think so. I don't believe so. Okay. Thank, good evening, Pat, and good evening, Chris. And I, I think we should uh, go to Mr. Zulis to start. Is that correct, Mr. Zulis? Well, I, I, I don't I don't know that we need to. I, I think this is a presentation from the committee. I, I, I would point out that uh, we we do have um, uh, uh, we are um, uh, looking to add two members to the committee, uh, and we are also looking to add a co-chair to the committee. Uh, the co-chair is not on the agenda tonight. The the appointment of a new co-chair, but. But I, but uh, I expect that will be on the agenda in the not too distant future. And I expect 
that um, that'll be Mr. Hart that will will be seeking the appointment of co-chair. Um, and so uh, that's 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 my understanding. What after discussing it with uh, with the chair Pat Lattimore. Um, and so anyway, that's that's for the future. But this is really a proposal from the committee to adopt really an outline for coming up with a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy for the town. So I'll, you know, I'll uh, defer to Pat and Chris. Hey, thank you, Ms. Lattimore. No, I'm, I'm, this is going to be led by um, Mr. Hart. Okay. Um, there's been, there are three people, on, as Chris teased it up, but we have a subcommittee, but Chris has been leading this work, so I'll defer to him on this. Um, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, uh, 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 Madam Chair, um, and everyone on the select board. Thanks very much for your time uh, uh, this evening. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and uh, I don't expect this presentation to take too long. It's uh, four slides. It, but since we have it, if we could move to the second slide, whoever owns the slide. There we go. So that's the first. Perfect. Um, so as Mr. Zulis indicated, um, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a proposal uh, for uh, work on a full draft of a townwide diversity, equity, and inclusion of DEI policy. Um, and just as a reminder, um, when uh, I think Pat was before you um, uh, earlier this year, uh, one of the preliminary findings from the, uh, the Equity and Justice for All Committee uh, was uh, an observation that the town did not have such a policy um, and the, there was a need to create one. Um, so in the process of following through with that recommendation, uh, we have, through a subcommittee, uh, done some research on what towns actually have done with regard to DEI policies or statements. Um, and based on that research, we formulated some thoughts on what Milton might adopt. You could move to the next. Uh, so uh, we looked at 10 towns, and that was, to be perfectly honest, somewhat arbitrary. You could probably find 10 more towns that you could have looked at or that we could have looked at. Um, but the observations were, were first that statements, that is townwide statements on uh, mostly diversity, uh, were fairly common. Uh, but policies, uh, at least publicly facing policies, um, uh, were, were not accessible. It might be that towns had some internal policies that were not outward facing, but um, they were uh, fairly difficult to find. They were focused on diversity. There wasn't a lot of discussion about equity or inclusion. Um, there uh, was some indication for at least a couple of towns, Brookline being one of them, and Brookline was a standout, as I know here, um, that had a, a central complaints process that went through their uh, DEI policy or, or anybody who was uh, in charge of DEI work. What was clear to us is that there's a lot of room for innovation. There's a lot of room for creativity. There's a lot of room for thinking about what's going to work for Milton uh, and be effective um, as a townwide policy. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so our recommendation, um, and I had, I don't know, um, Madam Chair, if it's been circulated to the entire committee, but I had a, um, a summary and synthesis as long as well as a, a policy that fleshed out some of these ideas. I don't know if everybody's received it. And I, I, I will talk about each of them in turn, but if not, I'm happy to circulate. I'm not sure. I think it was. There was an email from Mr. Hart that I think went to the full committee, the full board. Um, did everyone receive that? I see Mr. Doyle nodding his head, so I, I think. Adam, yes, I did. You did. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, perfect. So, so you've seen it, and I'll, and I'll and and that document I think uh, says a lot about what I'm going to say here. But uh, the policy outline provides a general statement, a townwide statement, um, and it uh, candidly it adopts from the Brookline statement. It, it tweaks it a bit and also adds ideas of equity and, and inclusion. Um, and then the components of a townwide policy would touch on um, hiring, uh, which uh, would likely include a general commitment to diversity in hiring, a commitment to retention and promotion to further build diversity, um, and responsibility responsibilities placed in specific town departments uh, to keep demographic data on applicants, interviewees, and hires. The next would be procurement. Um, simply adopting a specific policy with regard to uh, vendor procurement and focusing on minority or owned businesses. Uh, town government. Uh, so a big component of this would be 
including an explicit commitment to seek out diversity in all appointed committees, uh, whether appointed by the select board or the moderator, uh, and outlining the methods by which diversity would be sought after and maintained, such as uh, specific language and volunteer forms, collecting and maintaining demographic da data, um, and uh, altering or thinking of ways to solicit volunteers um, uh, to, in order to encourage more, uh, more diversity among the candidate pools. Uh, the policy would include training. Um, so essentially a commitment to create and mandate training uh, available for all departments and committees on um, best practices to encourage DEI and i uh, and belonging. Um, a complaints policy, um, which would be a formal process for intake, processing, um, and disposition of complaint. Uh, it would likely need to include the appointment of some accountable individual or individuals um, as the, the people or the body responsible for complaint intake and resolution. And then finally, uh, reporting. Um, there should be some commitment to annually reporting data on diversity and hiring, procurement, government committees, all the things that the rest of the, the policy outlines. Um, so this is what the, the policy we think should contain um, based on our research and, and, and our, our view of what the town needs. Go to the, I think the last slide. So um, what, what I'm hoping uh, that uh, the select board could, uh, could grant tonight is a motion that I'd like to make to adopt the policy outline as presented um, that would allow us to then work with um, select board representatives and uh, Mr. Dennehy uh, to draft the policy based on the outline. And, and Mr. Dennehy, um, I, I point to specifically because I think a lot of what we would envision um, would probably fall, uh, at least in, in some respect, to the town administrator. Um, so I think I have magic words for a motion. I'm happy to make it, but I don't know if you have any questions before I do so. Well, well let's th thank you, Mr. Hart. And let's open it up to our board to see if we have any questions um, for Mr. Hart or comments. I, I don't think we need the slides, the slideshow. If we want. Okay, why don't we take, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I think the recommendation, it sounds like it's to refer, you said select board representatives, it sounds like the policy committee of this board, which is Mr. Zulis and Ms. Collins, if they're willing, is probably the right place for this to be referred, uh, working along with Mr. Dennehy on this topic. Does that make sense to our policy committee? It, it, it does, Madam Chair, and, and, and for the purposes of discussion, I will make a motion to adopt and approve the Equity and Justice Committee's uh, policy uh, outline and proposal and summary uh, that was presented and to delegate to the policy committee and the town administrator the responsibility to work with the equity and justice committee to develop a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy for the town. Okay, Mr. Zulis has made a motion. Do we, Mr. Wells? Madam Friendly, Michael, instead of making a motion to adopt it, I'd like to give our representatives and the town administrators some time to weigh in on this. So I'd maybe adopt it, maybe forward it to them for this and let them, I want to, I don't want to take away their ability to have any comments. No, well, so the, the idea and, 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 and just to, just to be clear, the idea is to really just to get the board's um, blessing that directionally, this is the right way to go, right? The, the, the policy committee will work with the town administrator and the equity committee to develop the actual policy, but but I think we want to make sure that the board is is on board directionally with this kind of outline that's been presented by the equity committee. And, and as Chris mentioned, there's a lot of room uh, for creativity and innovation within that outline. But I think it's important for the policy committee and the town administrator to, to, to know that directionally the board is in favor of this approach. And then we can take that and, and develop a policy from it. That's the idea. So what, what I think I heard Mr. Zula saying is that, Richard, we would be um, adopting the proposal that's been outlined by Mr. Hart to refer this to the policy committee to have the town administrator assist um, and to develop the policy. So I, I think that's the motion. Is that correct? That it's we'd be adopting and approving the outline that's just been presented and delegating to the policy committee the responsibility of working with the Equity and Justice Committee and the, Mr. Dennehy to develop a policy. Okay. Given that, I'll, I'll second it. Just Just... I'll second it just, and just for purpose of discussion. My point is just, as Mr. Denny will know, especially in things like procurement, I think there are so many other levels of this, particularly so much we use regional procurement, regional, statewide initiatives, 
these things are already built into a lot of them. And I think Mr. Dennehy can, his team can, you know, highlight some issues like that that already exist. So um, I will second that, Madam Chair. May, may I may I just say something? I know I know we're in the middle of a motion. I, I don't. I don't yes, know, Mr. Hart. Uh, if I can, thank you. Um, I I did, uh, Mr. Wells. I appreciate that. I did I did forward the um, the outline to Mr. Dennehy uh, last last week. I and Mike, I don't expect that you've had any opportunity to take a look at it, but precisely for that reason that you that you point to, Mr. Wells, is that uh, it is crucial that the town administrator um, take a look. And yes. I I don't think that we could successfully have an, an operational policy without his and the select board's direct input. input. So I agree wholeheartedly. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you, thank you. So we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Do we have any discussion by the board or any questions for the Equity and Justice Committee? Seeing and hearing none, we can go to a vote on the motion. Uh, then all in favor of Mr. Zulis's motion. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Zulis. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. Mr. Wells. Yes. And myself, yes. Okay, well, thank you both uh, for being with us tonight. I think the next steps then are to uh, let the Policy Committee and the Equity and Justice Committee, Mr. Dennehy, take some time to do, do the work and, and come back to us with a proposal. You know, I, I thought of one other thing while Mr. Zulis was speaking earlier about the need to appoint a co-chair and some new appointments. I'm not positive, but I think this committee, when we appointed it a little over a year ago, had a had a term, a finite term of existence. And we may want to revisit that. I, I think we're coming up around a year. And if it was 18 or 24 months, I think we should ask the committee to let us know whether they think that's something we ought to take up at a future date, you know, to extend it so that um, it sounds like there's, there's a lot of good work happening and, and more to be done. So. Um, if anyone has any thoughts on that, I see people nodding. So maybe that's already being discussed. So Ms. Madam, yes, Madam Chair, um, we are having that conversation and we've had that conversation with a couple of the members here, um, but we have not had it as a general discussion with the rest of the board. What we're trying to do over the next couple of meetings is to figure out what is it, what are our goals for um, what we want to complete. And will it take longer than what our time, which is 18 months? 18 months, okay. So it's another six months. Okay, great. So, so, we'll, we'll, so let us know what your thoughts are on that when, when you've had a chance to talk with the whole committee about it. We will, thank you. Okay, thank you both for joining us this evening and thank you for your work uh, putting this proposal together. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Good night. All right, we're on to... We've deferred item eight, we're on to item nine, which is a presentation of the Milton Hazard Mitigation Plan 2021 update. I, and we're joined by, uh, is it Ann, is it Herbst? Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Herbst? From the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and our environmental coordinator, Erica DiDonato. Well, thank you both for waiting this evening. It's about 8.19, so thanks for sticking around. Yeah, um, thank you everyone uh, for giving us your time uh, tonight. Um, just as some background to this project, the town received a grant from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency uh, to update the town's hazard mitigation plan to be in accordance with um, FEMA guidelines. And the current version of the hazard mitigation plan was adopted back in 2014, and it addresses the potential impacts to the town um, from natural hazards uh, like flooding and high, wind, high winds. And this particular update uh, brings a focus to the impacts of climate change as well. Uh, and with this grant, the town selected um, MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, to assist the town um, with the updating process. Um, and so far, this process has involved putting together a project team composed of town staff members. And we have met to discuss uh, where the impacts of natural hazards most affect the town and have worked to set up goals uh, for addressing these impacts and mitigation measures that will uh, benefit the town. Uh, we have also held our first public meeting back in June uh, to receive input um, and concern, concerns from the public, uh, which we have taken into consideration. 
Um, and as mentioned with us today is Ann Herbst, uh, who is the Senior Environmental Planner uh, from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Uh, she'll be giving a brief presentation on the um, update to the plan. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ann. Okay. Thank you, Erica. And I will try sharing my screen. Um, uh, oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, um, and thank you to the Psych Board for the opportunity to present the work done by a, a team of town staff. Um, so as Erica said tonight, we're presenting the final draft of the updated hazard mitigation plan. Uh, it will be available for public comment for two weeks and then we'll submit it to MEMA and on to FEMA for approval. Uh, after FEMA approves the draft, it will come back to the Select Board for adoption. Uh, so tonight's uh, presentation is just informational. Uh, and as Erica says, MAPC has been providing technical assistance uh, to revise the plan. And I, I see that your agenda is, is really very long, so I'm going to be as brief as I can be. Uh, um, but I do want to acknowledge the leadership of the project team. Uh, as you can see, we have participation across many of the town's departments. And under Erica DiDonato's leadership, the team worked together to update and develop the plan. Um, so maybe one little step back is to tell you a bit a little bit about what hazard mitigation plan is. Um, so the focus is on natural weather-driven occurrences. So that's th not things like terrorism or chemical spills, for example. The town has other plans that address emergency response and other types of hazards. Um, so the focus is, is really on taking preventative steps to reduce the impacts of natural hazards. Uh, and hazard mitigation planning started uh, in the year 2000 uh, when the Federal Disaster Mitigation Act was passed. And, and the act has a goal which is for every municipality in the country to have a hazard mitigation plan. It's a goal, it's not a requirement, not every community achieves it, um, but FEMA has a pretty good carrot for adoption, which is that in order to be eligible for FEMA's mitigation grants, towns have to have a hazard mitigation plan. Um, and so this, this plan will be good for five years when it's adopted, and this is Milton's third plan. Um, so one of the things that the team did was identify uh, potential local risk areas. And so for Milton, this includes over a dozen known flooding areas in several areas where there's at least the potential for brush fire. Um, and in, in our region, flooding is the most frequent hazard, and that has certainly been true for Milton as well. Um, we also map all the critical facilities in town. Um, so we include disaster response sites, municipal facilities, sites that could need services, for example, nursing homes um, and infrastructure. So dams, pump stations, communications. And, and we overlay all the facilities with the flooding and hazard areas that we've identified in order, again, to identify and analyze uh, vulnerabilities. We also map future development areas uh, to, again, assess potential vulnerabilities. Um, so these are the highlights of the project priorities identified for the next five years. So this, this really is the heart of the plan. Um, you can see they really include a range of activities from very specific drainage and infrastructure projects to projects to address climate change risks to natural resource protection. Uh, it includes regulatory strategies, planning uh, uh, opportunities things like tree planting and solar strategies. Um, and as Erica mentioned, new in this plan is that we evaluated how risk may change and increase due to our warming climate. Um, so this is uh, really a, a brief overview. The plan will be is on and will stay on the Public Works website uh, and be available for review for the next two weeks. Uh, and that link is available in this slide. Uh, so it's on the Department of Public Works webpage. You'll find the link there to the hazard mitigation plan um, anyone can send comments by September 22nd, uh, and they'll be, you know, certainly considered and, and, and included in the plan. And uh, we're definitely interested in, in accepting comments, questions, or suggestions. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it there in case board members do have suggestions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Herbst. Thank One you. suggestion might be, if it's not already, I would put the slides up on the DPW webpage as well as the plan itself. Thank you. Uh, and maybe. Okay, and maybe Erica, if you could submit the plan to the board just by email, um, so everyone has a copy of it, but I think that would be helpful. You may have already done that. It, it may be in my email that I haven't seen, but um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Ms. Herbst or Ms. DiGiannato? Um, or Mr. Dennehy, any, any comment or questions for the MAPC? 
I do not. I, I do want to mention all the hard work that's gone on in the, in the collaborative. Uh, started with our, our first environmental coordinator, uh, Hillary Waite, and Erica has certainly carried the ball. Uh, if you look further down in our agenda this evening, uh, I will give further accolades to Ms. DiDonato for her work on a uh, coastal pollutant uh, remediation oh. grant uh, yeah. that the town was just awarded. So thank you for the collaborative effort. Always a good partner, MAPC. Uh, can continue uh, that relationship with the town of Milton. Thank you. Thank you. I was happy to participate. I also want to recognize Erica's leadership and, and very appreciative of the, of the participation of all the town staff. It was really an exceptional committee. You're, you're well served. Thank you. I see Mr. Doyle raised his hand. Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is most welcomed, and as you might suspect, has a nice marriage with the work of Milton's Conservation Commission. And that respect, I would like to ask if Erica could send John Cannon a copy along with um, an indication that any comments would be due to you by the 22nd of September, just so that the chair of the CONCOM can have a last minute opportunity to weigh in. Absolutely. Thank you. Great idea. And, and since comments are due on the 22nd, which is our next regularly scheduled meeting, I'm assuming this would be something that would be coming back to us perhaps in October for a vote. Is that I, the time I, frame? I wish I could say it's that fast. Uh, it's, oh, okay. So it's, it's a little unpredictable with MEMA and FEMA, but, okay. but part of the reason, frankly, to make sure this is before you now is that once it goes through the MEMA and FEMA process, if they approve it, um, and then you wanted to make changes, it would go back through their months long process again. So uh, for the public and for the board, I would suggest trying to get comments in before the 22nd to, to avoid a situation where FEMA's approved a plan that you're not going to want to change it then because it'll, okay. it'll add months to your approval time. So our timeline might be um, later this calendar year if it expires this year? Yes, I, I mean, we, we hope so. Honestly, there it's sometimes, it's sometimes it's a matter of a couple months. I'm a little concerned because uh, of all the hurricanes that uh, that can have an effect on how quickly FEMA reviews. But but there's there's grant deadlines upcoming in January, and I know MEMA and FEMA typically are very sensitive to that. And we will certainly say to them, we want it back by we want okay. to be able to be in, have it in place for the town oh. by by January. Okay, so that's helpful. I probably should have worded my question on differently. It's, I, I was thinking that the town had to approve this before we submitted to FEMA. It sounds like it's the other way around. There's a re, the review yeah. process by FEMA and MEMA before we actually vote on something. It, it's an unusual process. FEMA does not want you to approve it until they take a look. I at see. It. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Anyone else on the board, any questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, then uh, thank you very much to Ms. Erbst. And I, I think it can't be said enough that the Metropolitan Area Planning Council does a lot of great work with the town, especially in the areas of planning and public works. And I know you've um, done a lot, especially Josh, and I'm drawing a blank on Josh's last name, but he's worked a lot with the Master Plan Implementation Committee and the Planning Board on some planning projects. So we've, we've gotten a lot of benefit from our collaboration with MAPC, and I think Tabor Keeley is still our representative to the MAPC, so we're we're part of a, a larger regional system here, and this, this really yields a lot of benefit to us on these types of projects. So thank you very much, Anne and Erica, for all of your work on this project. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay, uh, moving right along at 829. Item 10 is a request uh, for an uh, uh, approval for the, this is essentially for the Mass Housing uh, Partnership providing the town with some technical assistance. It's a grant program that essentially continues Judy Barrett's good work with the Board of Appeals. I, my understanding is the chair of the Board of Appeals has already uh, signed this contract and um, they're looking for the select board to co-sign it. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll move to authorize the chair to sign a grant agreement from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, which offers technical assistance to Milton's multiple projects phase two. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. And myself, yes. Uh, item 11, we have an email from our town council. This is a discussion and, and a possible determination if we're to so vote but tonight by the select board that 41 Wharf Street is a unique property under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30B, Section 16E2. Um, I 
don't believe we have town council present, but he did send us an email, which is in the materials. We have a warrant article going to the October town meeting, as everyone knows, for 41 Wharf Street. And um, town council has sent us an email explaining that chapter 30B doesn't require us to solicit proposals to acquire property if our local jurisdiction through this board determines that we need a particular piece of property because of its unique qualities or location. Um, once, once we make such a determination, if we do, we would file a notice with the central register at least 30 days prior to signing a binding agreement to acquire the property. So this is a step in preparation for town meeting, which is coming up next month. Um, and we would want to take a vote to declare 41 Wharf Street a unique property to go through that central register publication process. Uh, town Council's pointed out that the unique nature is really because it's located between two parcels of land, 44 Wharf Street and 25 Wharf Street that are owned by the town. Uh, and together, the three parcels constitute the area known as Milton Landing. Um, we presently have three easements over the property. So um, those are reasons that Town Council is suggesting that we take this action. Any discussion on this item? Ms. Collins. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, I would be happy to actually uh, propose that as a motion um, for discussion purposes, but I, uh, I'm happy to see this move forward and I have nothing else to add. I will second on that, Madam Chair. Okay, and just for clarity, I think the motion that Ms. Collins would be making then is to is to make a determination that 41 Wharf Street is a unique property pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30B, Section 16E2. That's that's your motion, Ms. Collins. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I was town council also asking us to then add the language that you were um, referring to, that the prop property at issue, 41 Wharf Street, Milton, Massachusetts, 02186 um, is unique uh, and the reasons for that? I think those are what he would say that we might consider as the grounds. So we could discuss okay. those as the grounds and there may be other grounds that okay. members wish to raise. Okay, so we don't need to add that to the motion. Thank you. Okay, so I believe Mr. Wells seconded that motion. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, uh, all in favor of the motion, Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Zulis. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. Mr. Wells. Yes. Myself. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We're on to number 12, which is the finance committee's report. And we have several items under the finance committee report. So I'll go to Mr. Zulis and Mr. Doyle and Mr. Dennehy on this topic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the first item is the American Rescue Plan um, Act appropriation. Uh, this is a, re a, a, a recommended appropriation from the Finance Subcommittee that, um, that the uh, Public Works Department's request for funding for a water main improvement project, um, project, uh, project um, labeled W-21-1, um, and that that, um, that that project, that a um, million dollars of ARPA funding be appropriated by the Select Board for the purpose of that project. We discussed that project previously in at this board. We made a presentation along with Mr. Dennehy made a presentation to the uh, Warren Committee on it. We had a public hearing at which it was described to re residents and residents pre presented alternatives as well. And so uh, uh, the Select uh, the Finance Committee on uh, last Thursday morning voted to recommend that the select board appropriate a million dollars of ARPA funding for this public works uh, public works department water main improvement project. Um, and so based on their recommendation, I will make the motion to approve the public works department request for ARPA funding for water main improvement project uh, designated W-21-1 in the amount of $1 million. Second. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Any discussion on this motion? Ms. Ms. Collins, did you have your hand raised? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, all in favor, Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. And myself? Yes. Um, I just noticed that we have Amy Dexter, the assistant superintendent for schools, for the finance director at the schools present. So if we could have 
Uh, um, Ms. Stewart, if you could move Amy Dexter up to panelist, she may wish to join us for um, some of this discussion. I'm sorry, Mr. Zillis, please proceed. Well, well it's actually uh, quite uh, uh, quite well done that you, you added Amy here because the second matter that the, um, that the Finance Committee on Thursday morning voted was to appropriate the, appropriate the remaining um, funds under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, CARES, uh, for technology use at the Milton Public Schools. I believe it's approximately $1,500 were, were those remaining funds, but Mr. Dennehy may be able to give us the exact number. Um, Member Zulis, you are correct. There is a, a slight development today oh. uh, that may be worthy of a discussion at the okay. next finance subcommittee meeting. That number is correct. We did receive uh, in, in a series of invoices from uh, the Milton Food Pantry. If you remember, this board uh, allotted $65,000 to uh, Pat Brawley and her wonderful team uh, at the Milton Food Pantry. Uh, those invoices came back and it was $4,000. $485.28 shy of $65,000. That's another $4,485.28 of CARES money that we will have available after uh, the finance director, Karen Braval, sorts out um, the food pantry. So um, that just came in today. Uh, it's a great story with the, the amount of funding that was received uh, through this board uh, for those wonderful initiatives. But just to know that there is uh, some additional funding left. Um, in addition to the 1500 you mentioned. So. So, so, so then I guess I guess I'd revise the motion since there may be additional funding in phase that we could we could we, we certainly should bet and, and make a recommendation on a revise uh, our recommendation of the warrant of the finance committee um, which we talked about the remaining cares act funds uh, I would I would move that we approve an additional $1500 of cares act funding uh, for use towards technology related costs of the Milton Public Schools. I'll second the motion. Um, do we have any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Zulis. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. Mr. Wells. Yes. Myself, yes. Okay. The next item is the is the Norfolk County ARPA funding update, and I'll, uh, I'll ask Mr. Dennehy. He may have the latest information on that. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Zulis, members of the board. Uh, not much to update. Um, the Norfolk County commissioners hosted a meeting today that I, I could not attend. They, they've been in the process of doing hybrid meetings. Uh, one of the only uh, municipal entities I've seen doing hybrid meetings. So, um, but I, I I didn't catch it today. Um, but they didn't have any specific item listed for that. I know they are working through the process of hiring consultants to put their dashboard uh, and vetting process uh, in place. Uh, they were looking at uh, law firms as well to make sure that the $137 million that will be coming in as requests from um, the other 26 communities, including uh, in addition to this select board, um, will be vetted. So more to come, I'm assuming, at their meeting next Wednesday. Um, but um, just know that they are working through the process of hiring uh, consulting and a, and a law firm to vet all of the projects that are presented to them from the 27 communities. And, and know that, that the town departments are also working on next projects so that we, we can get those in to this board and then through to the Norfolk County Commission is in the most time efficient manner. Thank you, Mr. Dennehy. Um, Town meeting articles. Yes, next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we had a discussion on Thursday morning in our finance subcommittee, <coughs> pardon me, of the um, FY22 budget revision article. Uh, this article initially was intended to reallocate uh, funding because we thought we were going to be $47,000 short of the appropriation made by town meeting uh, in May. Uh, that uh, shortage of $47,000 was based on the final budget that was voted by the Mass Legislature, which 
which came up $47,000 uh, $40, less than we thought it would be per million. However, since that time, the, um, the, uh, our chief appraiser in Milton has revised his new growth estimates for this current year, FY21, uh, to, the, to, the, um, uh, to the good, uh, to the effect that the estimate is now $225,000 more than the initial new growth estimate. So um, if you uh, take that additional $225,000 that we're now estimating um, that can be used for the town budget, if you subtract out the $47,000 that we thought we were gonna have to make up for, uh, that now we won't, uh, that leaves us with about $178,000 of additional unallocated revenue for FY21. So the question is, how do we allocate that additional FY21 revenue? Um, we had some initial discussions um, at our meeting on um, a finance subcommittee meeting, finance committee meeting on Thursday. We voted to submit the article, which already has been submitted, but we didn't we didn't vote the amounts uh, because we didn't really have enough information at that point, and we may not as yet have enough information. Uh, to make a recommendation on numbers. Uh, there, is a, there is a request, you know, as, as this board knows, uh, the police department is uh, three officers down from what had been appropriated by prior town meeting, either two or three town, um, two or three years ago. Uh, the schools are down three um, individuals from what was, what was voted last December's town meeting. Uh, we have had additional um, uh, additional um, requests from other town departments. As we know, the library uh, came in below the requested amount for the library at town meeting. Uh, I think that was about thirty thousand uh, dollars. The cemetery um, has some additional needs of about uh, fifteen thousand dollars. Um, and the building commissioner has some additional needs. The planning department has some additional needs. The fire department has some additional needs. And then the school department, Ms. Dexter is here. The school department has, as I mentioned, they, they have those three staff, staff members, but their needs may well have changed. Uh, there was some indication on Thursday that their needs have changed since Thursday. Um, I'm not sure that we are in a position um, to make a recommendation. Uh, at this point, uh, I know we are running on time with the warrant. The warrant committee, I think, is meeting Monday, um, and warrant needs to go to print, I think, sometime around September 20th or so. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line is we have an additional $178,000 that town meeting in October can allocate to the FY21 budget. The question is how to do it. And so um, my view is that we probably need a little bit more work and that um, uh, we, we it would be good to get a consensus recommendation from the town administration, town administrator, and the schools on how to allocate that money if possible. If not, uh, you know, this board can make a recommendation, warrant committee can make a recommendation, town meeting can make a decision. But I think we need a little bit more work on this. Uh, I realize it'll put some time pressure on the warrant committee, but um, but this has come up very recently, and I think we need to do it in a deliberate fashion. So that's my view on that. Mr. Dennehy and Mr. Doyle may have may, may have views on that as well. Mr. Doyle? Just, I concur, if I may, Madam Chair. I, I think it's very important to have this uh, voted to the Warren Committee as a placeholder. We have the opportunity to do some revisions among the parties that Mr. Zulis identified. And even if it comes up tight against the calendar schedule, we have the opportunity to come up with a resolution. But it's very important that we move on these funds. Okay, agreed. Mr. Dunhe? So I, if I could just add that at the last joint finance meeting, uh, we had um, penciled in 7 a.m. on the 16th of September for a meeting. Um, some, I believe some of the school committee members may not be available that morning. so. I think we can regroup tomorrow morning and try to find a date early next week where we can sit and, and iron some of this stuff out and bring it back to this board uh, at a convenient date. Okay, and, and I'd I like to that, give- I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that makes a lot of sense. 
I, I'd like us to give uh, Assistant Superintendent Dexter an opportunity if she'd like to speak to the um, issue of the budget revision article. Um, and Assistant Superintendent Dexter, I understand the school committee's in a meeting at this time as well. So uh, we know you're probably between two different Zooms, but um, if you'd like to weigh in on anything, please feel free. Um, yeah, there, there are some needs for, for the school department that were eliminated in the request for FY21, as well as um, some other things such as um, bus needs, although we, we are trying to fund that um, through other means. Um, but the extra time would be helpful so that the sub finance, you know, the finance committee of the school committee could actually vote what their priorities are and um, to give Superintendent Jett and Town Administrator Dennehy a chance to, um, along with maybe Karen Praval and myself, to try to come to a consensus as Member Zulis um, mentioned. I think that's a good idea. Okay, thank, thank you, Ms. Dexter. I, I think the, I know that the Warren Committee clerk has reached out to the printer to, to uh, go over the, the deadline. It was able to push it back a little bit further into September for going to print with the warrant. It, it's a short, much shorter warrant than what we would have for an annual town meeting warrant. Uh, there's no lengthy planning board articles or other articles. So uh, other than probably the stormwater article, there, there may be some that may take a few pages, but um, the, hopefully the warrant committee, I know that they're looking for this information. They have sent us a few emails asking for what the recommended amounts for any departments would be. So I'm sure that the warrant committee chair and the members would appreciate moving this along as quickly as we can, um, but it does sound as though we need to have further discussion between the Finance Committee and the School Finance Subcommittee. Mr. Doyle. To that point, Madam Chair, I was asking Amy if she has a date for the next School Committee Subcommittee uh, of Finance meeting. Do you have that calendar yet, Amy? Um, yeah, we meet Tuesdays at five o'clock and um, our only, well, one of our requests would be that we try to find a time that's convenient for Dr. Craighead because she is chair of the finance committee of the school committee and she hasn't been able to attend the last couple because of the time of day that um, it's been scheduled for. So I would just request that we try to accommodate her schedule as best we can. We were trying for 7 a.m. for her, right? Amy? Sorry, Arthur, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to um, confuse anybody. I was asking about the, the time for the school committees, subcommittee on finance. When next Tuesday next at five o'clock. Next Tuesday at five. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to make the, as much of an accommodation as possible. That's what Mr. Denny was talking about. So you will have uh, information from them Tuesday after that meeting. Um, yes, I can ask them to do that. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Yep. Can I ask, yeah. uh, and sorry, Richard, I see your hand up, but just in terms of scheduling, Amy, you may not know this, but might it make sense for us to meet at five on Tuesday? I don't know if anyone's available, but might might it make sense for us to, to have a joint meeting or meet right, right after your meeting on Tuesday at five? Well, I, I think they might want to have an opportunity to vote anything that Superintendent Jett recommends once we have discussions okay. with um, Karen and Mike. Okay. But I can certainly ask them and um, we can get back to you. Okay. Yeah. But maybe gonna... even like they meet at five and then we have a joint meeting at 5 30 or something yeah, like that. If that works for people. Sure. All right. I, I can ask them that tomorrow. That sounds like a good plan. And Mr. Wells, if you'll just indulge me for a minute too. I think that sounds like a good plan. If, if on our end, if Mr. Zo Mr. Doyle and Mr. Zulis and Mr. Dennehy and, and obviously Karen Preval can um, coordinate a time to meet on Tuesday evening, that I'm sure that would be appreciated by the Warren Committee. And I, and I would suggest inviting George Ash or the Warren Committee Chair to the 5.30 meeting or when, whenever you meet jointly. He did attend some of the joint finance meetings last year. And I think that helped their process. So that, that might be something you'd consider. Mr. Wells. Mr. Wells, you're muted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Ms. Dexter. Um, Mr. Denny, I, I just, my, my only thought is, and I, as you know, Madam Chair, I don't weigh in on this finance, I'm not on finance committee, so I kind of like let you make these decisions, but you know, we made some deep cuts 
um, particularly on the public safety side, I just, my own thought here is that we look at using this amount of money to replace cuts we made versus adding things because then the cuts get pushed off again. And from an operational side, having lived through this, I know how hard it is to get it back once you lose. Yeah, no uh, fair points, Mr. Wells. Mr. Dennehy. Yeah, and, and to your point, Mr. Wells, Member Wells, the, the, the point I was trying to make at the finance subcommittee meeting was that we lost two um, patrol officer positions uh, as a part of last year's rollback. Um, the ask was to replace those two positions um, with the understanding that it could come with full health care benefits for each position, um, roughly $50,000 per year per position, $22,000 per position for health insurance, and then cut that in half. I talked to Chief King and, and he had talked about um, get, being able to get them in a class in January. So what you'd be looking at is about $76,000 for the two positions for the remaining oh, man, part of yeah. FY22. But we can go further into details for that. Again, I, I just for the viewing audience, I think everyone needs to know that this is a good story for the town. This is operating money. This is not um, capital one-time expenditures. This is stuff that we can add to the operating budget um, based on um, the work of Chief Appraiser and, and our Board of Assessors to um, increase the, the growth as, as we all see um, projects like the one we, we heard to see earlier this evening that may come online. So um, it, it's, it's good. This is good news for the town. I, I only say that, Madam Chair and Mr. Dennehy, because those two positions were cut in 2009, took until fiscal 17 to get them back. Just two jobs. Took that many years. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Doyle had his hand raised. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to get back to Mr. Zulis and let him know that I should be available on Tuesday, the 14th, which is the date we're talking about, I believe, between 6 and 7 30, at which time a confirm meeting takes place. Yeah, I, I've actually heard. I think we have some scheduling issues on the town side, so we'll 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 that may that 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 evening may not work, but but we'll uh, we'll make it happen. Okay, make it happen. And, and to the extent, you know, I, I generally like to kind of defer to the finance committee and, and let the finance committee take the lead on this. But the extent the finance committee is looking to members of the board for priorities, I I think speaking individually, the priorities for me would be police for the reasons Mr. Wells stated, as well as schools for the discussions that were taking place in the spring at the Warren Committee, at town meeting, among our board and among the school committee. Um, I, I know that there are needs in the library, the cemetery, the building department, all of the departments have, have needs. Uh, I, I would argue our own office has some needs, but um, I, I think based on the discussion in the, in the spring, I, I would prioritize education and school needs as well as the police needs. So um, for, what that, for what that is worth, and I know you've already, you're already talking about these issues, so you're already aware of that. Any other discussion? Uh, if on, D, on item 12D1, I know we have a cable fund appropriation, but we could, if not, then I want to thank Ms. Dexter for joining us. I know she's in the middle of another school committee meeting. So, so thank you for your time this evening. Amy. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. We're, um, cable fund appropriation. Should we go on to that, Mr. Zulis? We, yeah, we have that also as item 13, so. Um. Yeah, and, and Madam Chair, uh, uh, my memory and my notes suggest that we didn't actually talk about that at finance subcommittee. I don't think we, uh, or vote, we certainly didn't vote on it. So I don't think we, I think that's more of a, a it's more of an item 13 issue, uh, which is the recommendation uh, from the Municipal Broadband Committee on the okay. cable fund and uh, cable fund appropriation. Arthur, did I miss that? Did, did we talk about that Thursday? I don't think we did. No, it's not in my notes. Okay. Okay. All right. So why don't we go into item 13 then? Okay. Um, you want me to take that in, Madam Chair? Yes, Chief? Mr. Zulis. All right. So, so um, as a recap, um, uh, this board has recommended a warrant article uh, for a cable fund appropriation for the design and construction of a municipal broadband network. Uh, and that article has been reviewed by the Warren Committee, not voted on, but I think it's fair to say uh, fairly favorably looked upon uh, by the members of the Warren Committee, but they're waiting for a number uh, for what the proposed appropriation from the cable fund uh, would be. 
the Municipal Broadband Committee voted uh, this morning to recommend a number of $350,000 for that cable fund appropriation. And I'll give you a brief synopsis about why. Uh, the cable fund is a, an amount uh, that, that was created in uh, 2017, uh, or actually 2019 time when they created the fund. Uh, it, it is an amount of money that is um, funded to the town as part of the cable fees uh, that are paid to our cable operators, Comcast and RCN. They pay under their current current con current contracts five percent of their uh, fees to the town, though, and that goes into this fund. Of that five percent, I believe it's four and a half percent goes on to the Milton Public Access um, uh, channel, Milton Public Access nonprofit organization, to run the Milton Public Access cable service in Milton. Uh, but a portion of that, half percent, is kept in this cable fund. It, it, has, it had grown um, as of 2017, when the actual fund was established, it had grown to $371,535. Um, since 2017, um, from 2017 through June 30th, the end of last fiscal year, it grew from 371,000 uh, 535 to $741,552, approximately $80,000 per year uh, the fund had grown by. Um, some years it's been a little bit less, some years it's been $50,000, and then there has been an additional amount. The, the, need, the, 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 the fund, uh, as voted by town meeting, is supposed to be used um, for uh, supporting uh, cable, television, uh, uh, public access television services in Milton, su supporting um, uh, review of the franchise agreement, um, but primarily support for uh, uh, the provision of public education cable um, uh, services in Milton. Uh, and so the Broadband Committee, uh, after consulting with town council, who consulted with town uh, divisional local services, is of the view that um, fixing our broadband system, fixing our fiber uh, in Milton, the fiber that connects our town buildings, will help to support cable um, public education and cable services in Milton because they that those services run over the fiber, right? And so to the extent the fiber is old and less serv serviceable and at capacity, then cable services don't run as well. So. Uh, so the proposal is to use a uh, proportion of those funds after reviewing uh, the, the ins and the outs, if you will, of the fund over the last five years with the finance director, Karen, Karen Preval, this morning. Uh, the committee voted uh, to uh, recommend an appropriation of $350,000 from this fund, which was $741,000 last year. The reason for that is uh, the committee felt that it was best to be uh, conservative to make sure that this fund is available for other cable needs going forward. Um, the $350,000 um, uh, is where the fund, roughly where the fund started five years ago. Uh, and so uh, it's, it was the view of the committee that that would allow for additional needs from this fund and that it would be, it would allow for different additional purposes rather than to use this fund just for one purpose, the design and construction of, of fiber, it allows for additional purposes for the use of this fund. And so, so that's why the, the committee at this time is recommending an appropriation of $350,000. Sorry, I, I may have not articulated the thoughts very well, but um, if there's any questions, just uh, let me know. I thought it sounded very reasonable. Um, yeah. Does anybody have comments or questions for Mike Silva? I, I will just add that uh, uh, the finance director, Karen Prebell, uh, uh, in response to her question, said that based on her review of the fund, she was comfortable with that, that amount as well. So. Mr. Wells. That was long-winded, Mr. Zulis. I know. I, so I'm trying to, I tried. 
one word I'm hung up on is because I think you'll yeah. because I, I understand five of the five of that very well in, in the operations, but three hundred fifty one thousand dollars. For fixing, what do you want to fix? I, I just... No, no, we want to we want to build. We want to. We want to build. Okay, all right, all right, I get it. okay. And, and, that's and where so, I thought. And, and, well and, what, and what it'll take, just to fill it out though, what it'll take, uh, based on the feasibility study that we saw about two years ago, it'll take about a million bucks. And and frankly, uh, I think you're going to see the, the broadband committee come to this board and recommend that um, that 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 balance, the six hundred fifty thousand dollar, be made up in ARPA funding. Um, okay. And so you may see that request before town meeting, and it, it, it may be a vote subject to town meetings signing off on this, or you may see that request after town meeting. But I think you're going to see the broadband committee recommend that the balance of that million dollars come from ARPA, 350 from the cable fund, 650 from ARPA. I'm, I'm fine with that, and I'm supportive of both. So I just, for a second, you scared me, and. Yeah. Maybe think that you wanted to put some band aids on existing, which no. does not work in the infrastructure world. Okay. No, I'm all set. Thank you, that. Madam Chair. All right. When well, I heard the word, I'm like, he can't yeah. mean that. All no, right. no, no. I appreciate that, and that's that's uh, that'll be that'll be helpful as we as we um, as we go out and um, and uh, and talk about this to the public more than we already have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Does anyone wish to make a motion? I'll make a motion to support this three three. Is it three hundred fifty one thousand exactly, Michael? Three hundred fifty, yes. To to uh, fund three hundred fifty one thousand dollars for this project out of the, the cable fund cable account that uh, Mr. Zulis has identified. A second. Ms. Collins, did you have your hand raised? Uh, yes. I, I'm sorry. I, I did not hear. I thought I heard Mr. Wells say 351 again. But, yes. Or was it 350? 351. Okay, just making sure. Thank you. No, actually, actually, no it's 350. just 350. Well, it's so 350? Friendly, I, all right. I'm sorry. I thought you said 351. <laughs> Okay, okay. 350. Right. Thank you. Good, Thank good you, catch Wanda. there, Ms. Collins. Okay, so the motion is for 350,000. It was seconded. And it was seconded. Any discussion? And just to make clear, that'll be that that number will be in the warrant article for the cable fund appropriation. You should have taken the extra thousand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all in favor, Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Zulis. Yes. Mr. Wells. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. And myself, yes. The next item on our agenda is um, for approval is a first amendment to the employment agreement between the town administrator and the select board. I believe everyone has, should have a copy of the first amendment that was drafted by uh, Labor Council, Correct. Andy, Andy Waugh, and um, it's, it provides for a 2% increase for the town administrator for FY22, which is the current fiscal year. Um, any discussion on this item? And Mr. Dennehy, certainly, please feel free to weigh in. Uh, or, or if not, well, do we have a motion? I'm ready to make a motion, Madam Chair. I'm, I'll make a motion to support uh, the recommendation of Town Labor Council on the 2% uh, increase for fiscal 22. And, and can we add to it to approve the First Amendment? Sure, absolutely. Members? Sure, absolutely. I'll second. Okay, motion made and seconded. Mr. Zulis. I will just say, hearkening back to um, our evaluation of um, um, a few minutes ago, uh, this is this is more than well earned and more than well uh, 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 more than well earned. And, uh, so that's, <laughs> I wish I could say it more articulately, but uh, Mr. Dennehy deserves it. Okay. We're approaching that is at that hour, Mr. Zulis. <laughs> All right, any other discussion on the motion? Uh, then if not, uh, Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. And myself, yes. And uh, thank you to Mr. Dennehy for thank all you of his work. Thank, thank you. you. Much appreciated. A one-day liquor license, we had two of them coming up now on our agenda. One for the Wakefield Estate, one for Historic New England. I'll make a motion, Madam Chair, to approve two one-day local licenses, one for the Wakefield Estate and one for Historic New England on, I don't know how to date, 
I'm reading this off my phone. Uh, do you want to vote them together or, or we can yeah, vote I'll, them I'll, I'll do them together, yeah. October. All right. I'll, they may. I, I can just read into the record. It's the Mary Wakefield Estate is as October 9th, Saturday, and uh, that's for an Oktoberfest event. And then the Historic New England is looking for one-day liquor license for September 23rd uh, for an event they're having at the Eustace Estate Healing Through Writing Workshop. So Mr. Wells has made a motion to approve both of those. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Collins. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Uh, then let's vote. All in favor, Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Uh, Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. And myself, yes. Okay, that brings us to item 17. That item is going to be deferred. That was a report of the policy committee. We'll put that on a future agenda. We're on to meeting minutes. We have several dates. Um, let's see, we have March 11th. And we also have three dates that are, are have already been approved by the Finance Committee. The dates of April 30th, May 27th, and June 7th were really meetings of the Finance Committee that we posted for the board as well in case any member of our board would like to attend them and take part. So the, the minutes have just been duplicated for the board. Um, and we also have minutes of August 6th, which I think uh, I, I did read them and I, I think we may have a, a few changes to make to those. So I, I would suggest we defer August 6th, but approve the other ones this evening, if that's agreeable to everyone, if everyone's ready to vote on the other dates. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from March 11th, April 30th, May 27th, and June 7th, 2021. I'll second. Okay, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. And myself, yes. Um, item 19 is um, a proclamation for Laurie Stillman, who is going to be stepping down as Milton Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition Director. We all received an email from her and from Caroline Kinsella. Uh, there's an event on September 21st that we've all been invited to, and, and the thought is to for the board to issue a proclamation. I actually started working on this and then sought out some dates that Laurie has served in different capacities on the school committee and with the um, Substance Abuse Coalition and just received that information in the last couple of days. And I have not had an opportunity to go back and finish the draft of the proclamation. Um, so I guess we could do one of two things. Either we could um, just authorize the, you know, the issuance of one and I, and I could continue working on it and circulate it hopefully in the next couple of days so that everyone can review it, or we could put this on a future agenda. Our next item, our next regular meeting is the 22nd, which is the day after the coalition's event, but we we may need to, we may wish to consider adding a meeting prior to the 22nd. We do have an open meeting on complaint that's been filed, and we have um, potentially a couple, a couple of other smaller items that we could add to that agenda, including some additional minutes to be approved. So I, what is the sense of the board? My apologies for not getting an opportunity to finish this. I, I wanted to really um, include in it some of Laurie's accomplishments on the coalition and with the school committee. And Ms. Collins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm comfortable with, um, I, I, I don't know if we want to say um, delegating or, or authorizing uh, the chair to work on um, or create a proclamation uh, celebrating uh, the uh, Milton Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition Director Lori Stillman um, as she steps down from her post. That's a motion, I will second. Uh, okay, thank you, that, that would be great. And again, my apologies for not getting a draft out sooner. Um, any other discussion? And Just to thank you for you. <laughs> no apologies necessary. Yeah, I was oh. say well, what you do. thank you, but <laughs> thank you, but I, I was hoping to have had it to the board prior to today. Um, okay, then uh, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor, Mr. Doyle. Yes. Ms. Uh, Mr. Zulis. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. Mr. Wells. Yes. And myself. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Town administrators report, Mr. Dennehy. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I have one item listed here tonight. The second item I can talk about in, in, in a later agenda item of things that um, the chair did not anticipate. But the first one here is, uh, again, 
a thank you to our uh, environmental coordinator, Erica De Donato. So um, uh, very recently, uh, the town was awarded uh, one of only four coastal pollutant uh, remediation grants. Um, the state of Massachusetts awarded just under $290,000 to the town of Barnstable, uh, city of New Bedford, town of Provincetown, uh, and the town of Milton. So kudos to uh, Ms. De Donato. Um, this project, this $33,200, will um, Milton will complete the design and engineering of a pool um, that can help treat water uh, near the property of the Cunningham Elementary School, as we all know, uh, which runs off into Gulliver's Creek and then becomes a part of the Ponset River, uh, which is a critical environmental concern area. Um, so this is great work uh, by Ms. De Donato. Uh, and this money, know that this money will be well spent and that we're just one of four communities in Massachusetts to receive this grant. So uh, we continue to see great grant writing from um, all of our departments, uh, especially uh, DPW uh, and Ms. De Donato. So a huge thank you to her and that group as they, they move forward uh, with this best management practice. That's great. I, that is terrific news to get that grant, Mr. Dennehy. Did you have a second item in your report also? Uh, I, I do actually. Uh, late, late this afternoon, uh, we received an email uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency uh, notifying the town um, that the EPA has proposed to add the Lower Neponset River to the Superfund National Priorities List. Uh, this, is, this is huge news. It's a 3.7 mile stretch of the Lower Neponset River. Um, there will be a virtual public meeting um, that has been scheduled for October 5th. I'll make all uh, this, both this announcement and the login credentials uh, and agenda for that meeting um, uh, on the town's website tomorrow and, and put it out through our social media outlets. But again, th this board has, has heard from Doug Gutrow and his team uh, at the EPA uh, on several occasions. Uh, the Mass Department of Environmental Protection filed this with the EPA uh, on behalf of uh, local residents and other interested parties including NEPRA and the Ponset uh, River Watershed Authority. So uh, great collaborative between the city of Boston uh, and, and Milton and DEP to get this uh, to the EPA. And great news that they've, they've proposed this uh, uh, on their Superfund National Priorities list. So uh, very, very good news for the, for the town. Thank you, Mr. Dennehy. That, that is great news. Any comments or questions for Mr. Dennehy? Uh, then on to the chair's report. The, the only item I wanted to bring up tonight was that we circulated a program for the vigil on Friday evening at six o'clock again on the town green, Baron Hugo gazebo um, for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, Mr. Doyle has already done so, but I, I'd like to reiterate his thanks to the clergy association in particular for helping us to put this program together. Uh, and also to Mr. Wells who has uh, arranged for a speaker from New York. We uh, have on the program Sergeant Supervisor of the Detective Squad, Brian Coughlin of the New York Police Department. He's going to be the featured speaker for our vigil. Uh, we're also going to have uh, a few other speakers, including from the Clergy Association prayers, um, a couple of songs sung by Pauline Wells from the Cambridge Police Department, and uh, an instrumental um, song that the Clergy Association has put together, um, has made arrangements for a violinist to do an instrumental piece. There is going to be ringing of the bells from the two steeple churches on the on either side of the town green. Rabbi Benjamin will be offering a prayer uh, and we'll have um, a speaker from the clergy association give a reflection. So there's, I, I think it's a nice program that the clergy working with us has put together. Uh, they've driven the program and I, I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Sergeant Supervisor Coughlin. Mr. Wells, I don't know if you'd like to add any words about his background or anything about the vigil. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to everyone who's done so much to make this happen. And I was, it's actually Coughlin G. We say a Coughlin, but New York oh, is called Coughlin. the high okay. G. Ryan is actually one of three brothers in the NYPD that were all in service to the city on that day. Um, fortunately, all three of them survived, although um, as you will hear from him, 9-11 um, was the worst devastation since Pearl Harbor, which was of our parents' lifetime. And um, I, I just quote 
Commissioner Brad at the 15th, I was privileged to be at the 15th anniversary at 9-11. And Commissioner Bratton made a statement that day that if you walked up on any street in New York and asked any New Yorker on that day to name three people who were killed from New York in those attacks, he said most people couldn't because time just moves on. And I think it's um, it's very important that we remember this and that we memorialize. And we can't forget those original flights originated in our city and, and many of the victims are from our state. And uh, for the residents of this town, I've said this in our meeting before, most people don't even know this. Our community did unbelievable work for three months, two trips a week for three months. We took care of 500 first responders and it was an amazing effort that just came out of a phone call. And I, I always remember Jim Mullen was chair of the select board. And he called on the phone and he said, we're gonna do whatever we can do. And we did. And um, so I think it'd be great to have someone who you know, lived it. Brian was the first one to actually bring me to ground zero in that first week. Um, I'd rather let him describe those days and the people. And um, But to the residents of this town, I think we owe it to all the victims and all the responders and all the heroes that um, did so much, not to make America better, because out of tragedy comes greatness. And we saw some great acts of humanity and heroism and love from that first day. So thank you all for your, and um, you can just repeat the time. I know it's six o'clock in the town green. So I, I hope that, all of our residents come out and I'm going to go back to the blood. Do I, Susie, do we have any um, spots left for the blood drive tomorrow? Richard, I will check. I think I caught her off guard. <laughs> yeah. well, I just want to make I, sure I, we fill them all. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to mention the, the blood mobile next, but just in, in re regarding the vigil um, in particular to Reverend Maurice Davis and Pastor Shelley of East Congregational Church, also Reverend Lisa Ward of the First Parish, they seem to be the ones who have been either on our meetings or driving the program. So I think they've been the core group working on this for the Clergy Association. Maurice Davis is the president of the Clergy Association. Thank you to all of them for, for the efforts that they've put into putting the program together. And, and again, we are going to have the Project 351 ambassadors from the high school with their stone tribute garden. I think that'll be a nice touch on the gazebo and thank you to Mr. Dennehy for working with them. So we invite residents of the town to come out. We, we, the you know, masks are not required for outdoors, but it is the health director's recommendation that um, that if we have a large crowd that people are wearing the masks and in social distance as much as possible. We are gonna have some masks available if people need them at the town green. Um, and and just tomorrow, this is a two-day observance. So the vigil is Friday evening, but the blood mobile is tomorrow. And Susie Stewart of the Select Board Office has done a little yeoman's work on putting the blood drive together, has recruited a lot of volunteers from town hall, from the board. Uh, Ms. Collins, I think, is going to be helping with the check-in. Some of our members have um, signed up already to donate blood. Uh, a lot of residents have. So we've had a terrific response to the blood mobile and um, looking forward to a great turnout tomorrow and a, and a successful blood drive. So thank you very much to Susie Stewart for all of her efforts on coordinating that and, and making those arrangements and suggesting it in the first place. Um, it really shows the the, uh, the charitable effort we're trying to do at the same time as, as all as part of this observance. That, that's all I had. Uh, and again, the vigil will be broadcast live on MATV for anyone who cannot attend. Uh, it, it will be carried live and I'm sure replayed over the course of the weekend and the ensuing days. I have no other topics on the, I, I should mention as I did, we had an open meeting while complaint filed against the board. So we could, we may want to add a meeting to consider that sooner than the 22nd, but um, the 22nd is not too late. It would just, the, the response would be a few, do a few days later than that. So mm -hmm. Uh, I'll defer to the board on whether we want to add a meeting. I, I think we could coordinate it offline with Susie in terms of scheduling, getting everyone's schedules together. But if so, that may be something we want to look at for next week. I have no other report. Does anyone have a report this evening? Mr. Doyle? Uh, none, Madam Chair, at this time. Mr. Zulis? Nothing, Madam Chair. Ms. Collins? No, Madam Chair, thank you. Mr. Wells? Oh, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, public comment response. We had none this evening. Future agenda items. So our next regular scheduled meeting is the 22nd. Um, anyone have an item for discussion at that meeting or a future meeting? 
And what is the sense of the board on whether we want to add a meeting prior to the 22nd? Could be a daytime meeting uh, if it's just a matter of, you know, an open meeting or a complaint response or something, you know, something, but if it's ministerial or administrative like minutes, Mr. Wells. So Madam Chair, I'm going to be out of state from the 22nd to the 27th and I'm not sure yet if I'm gonna be able to participate on the 22nd. And so if you wanna have something beforehand, day or evening, whatever it is, I'm open and I'll, whatever you wanna do. Okay. Um, what's the sense of the, the members? Mr. Zulis? Uh, you know, do we wanna try something next Wednesday night just for the purpose of getting that, um, that budget article uh, resolved? We, we may be in a position to do it by then. Um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just, it's a good idea, but I'm just looking at the calendar. That is the start of Yom Kippur at sundown oh. on the 15th. So, okay. All right. um, want to go earlier? Uh, I, yeah, I guess we could do something daytime if we wanted to that day or, or maybe Tuesday, well, Tuesday the 14th. Is that an option for members? We'd have to, let's see, today's, yeah, we'd have enough time to post for Tuesday if that worked. That, that may not help us on the budget article because I think that's the. Okay. Standard. So the school committee finance committee is meeting. Okay, so I'll be looking at daytime on the fifteenth then. Prior to the prior to the to sundown. I can do that. Something. I can do it before one p.m., Madam Chair. Before one, okay. Does that I'm work for others? I'm on a tight window. I can do it between eleven and one, and I can do it any time after three. Uh, that was that was a hard one. Sorry. Between eleven and one, are others available at that time? I can also uh, adjust to go after three o'clock. That works. I could do either one of those. I'm, yeah, I can as well. I'm, I'm I, I, three. Michael, I how know. much time do you think? How much time do you think to do it to address it? Actually, I I don't know if we want to take the budget article up. In a daytime meeting, um, but uh, I have a, I'd have a hard stop at four that day, so I'd do better at the eleven to one kind of thing. Okay. Um, so I, I well, if we wanted to take the budget up in the evening, I, I think we were either looking at the twenty second because the sixteenth would be the the Yom Kippur Holy Day, right? Uh, And, and Tuesday the 14th is too early, so I think we're looking. Okay, so keep the budget on for the 22nd. And Mr. Wells, you're not going to be here for that evening, but um, I will not. So don't don't do anything to me, Madam Chair. Whatever the rest of the board, uh, it's just the remainder of the board. Okay, so what? So I guess we're going to keep the meeting on the 22nd. We'll, you know, if we have something that's really that we think really we should defer until October, we can do that. Um, and maybe we take up the budget and some other items. You have a regular meeting on the 22nd, but anything that's really uh, either it's something that Mr. Wells is working on or something that we really want the full board, therefore we'll defer that to October. And we'll add sometime around 11 o'clock on the 15th. Sounds like that works for everybody, 11. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Um, and, and if there's any items to be added, please let Susie and me know. Community happenings, obviously the events we've just talked about this weekend, tomorrow the Blood Mobile and, and Sunday with the, Saturday, Friday, excuse me, Friday with the vigil. Mr. Dennehy, you had your hand raised. Uh, yeah, Dennehy. Madam Chair and members of the board, if I might, just for a, a quick second. So a, lo a local group had reached out to me wondering if, if I could kind of spread the word. The group is called Milton Sports for All. Uh, their idea is to provide a new opportunity for kids to participate in sporting activities um, in a less competitive, more recreational environment. So um, my understanding is this program will be open to those in grades four through eight and who reside in Milton uh, and have been asked to pass along the information. It seems like a great opportunity for, uh, like, as it reads, a, a less competitive, um, uh, more recreational environment. So anyone interested... Uh, can email Milton Sports for All at gmail.com. So I did I did say that I'd pass that along to the, the viewing audience tonight. Again, it's Milton Sports for All at gmail.com. 
Okay. Any other community ha any other community happenings? Farmers market is on for a few more weeks on a Thursday down at the wharf. Before that close, sometime in October is when that will end. Um, okay. If no other if no other events to talk about, then I will move that we enter executive session to consider the purchase exchange lease or value of real property, specifically 334 Edge Hill Road, believing that having such discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the board and to enter executive session to construct, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collect and, I think that's and to collect, conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel for all town unions believing that having such discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the board's negotiating position. We will not return to uh, open session. We will adjourn from the executive session. We have a second to the motion. Second. Okay, all in favor, Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. And myself, yes. Okay, so thank you to everyone. Thank you to MATV. We are now in executive session.